and like these does come out at like 20 yards and like my dad like clearly will tell the story of like he would hear like dunk like my arrow going through the soybean dunk mm. <laughs> and like it was like i emptied the quiver and didn't like touch him <laughs> episode 23 on our podcast right 23 i think i'm gonna stop counting at this point are we at that point where we don't have to episode 227,000? Yeah, at some point you gotta just we're just doing them. We're just doing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, episode twenty three. Two of them today again, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I think it'll be good. Um, man, it's we're like July within sight at this point. Yep, it's time. Today's the seventeenth. Had a big velvet buck on camera this morning in Kentucky. Yeah, some of them are a lot further along than than others. Uh, Brian sent us a picture yesterday from from PA. Yeah, in fact, I'll show it to you here. This buck's like full ground. Eh. <laughs> I mean, three, three, I, three quarters. I am surprised probably. per our kind of our pre, pre-game um, with our guest today. The we haven't seen any of those bucks that were pretty far along in Kansas yet. Like those ones early in the game were like, that's mm-hmm. a beast. Yeah, nothing. I, yeah, haven't seen them. But we did have that one that looks to be a big buck, but way behind. That dude's three inch spikes at this point. I guess you can't really see, but I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. Every bit as much as that one you got in Kentucky. For sure. If not a little more. Yeah. Nice buck. Oh, well, I figured these out too. What's that? Mulberries. Mulberries. Yeah. Yeah, that's good deer food. Are those edible for people? I think so. They look like blackberries, right? They mm-hmm. just look like blackberries. There's a bunch of them right in my yard, like on the... At your house? Yeah, my house. And oh, I, I bet that's like a deer central station at some point. Deer central station. <laughs> Platform nine and three quarters. Yes. We... uh yeah, I saw them all, and I was like, what the heck are these? Because they look like blackberries, but they're mm-hmm. growing on, like, a tree, like a big tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mulberries. Yeah, mulberries. Hmm. Can you yeah. make pies out of those? Probably. Mul- mulberry pie? Do they make wine out pies, of that? Mr. Tweety. Pies. They make mulberry wine? That sounds... Strawberry wine? Probably. Mulberry it's wine? got sugar, and all it needs is sugar. You make wine. <laughs> yeah, you make wine out of anything. Toilet wine. Pretty much. Toilet wine. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, oh, it's so cool that we're finally like, that was like a struggle. And get, when you, when you finally get out of that shed hunting season, then it's just like, there's just, just not there. a lot that You're just happens. floating. Yeah. Not a lot that happens. Well, we're getting food. It's just all spaced out. So like, mm-hmm. well, we got those beans in, mm-hmm. uh, it'd have been a week, a week ago now or j- mm-hmm. just over. Got some rain. Uh, I don't know if we Here. have. Yeah, that's what Chris and I were just talking about before. They haven't got shit out there. No, they haven't. In They're three, dry. three weeks is what he said. Turn it off, I'm dry. Well, yeah, we got um, we got rain just as it was ending, and maybe that night, which mm-hmm. was awesome. And it was good soil and moisture. We're supposed to get a lot of rain up here this weekend. Too. Yeah, I think there's some in the forecast here. So we're in better shape than the Midwest and certainly the far west. Yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, you know, we, we talk about... We are seeing some bucks, but like just not a lot. Those those bucks, number one, are bachelored up. Number two is they're in like a core area of like twenty acres at this point. Like mm-hmm. those deer just aren't moving. Food bed, food bed, food bed. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, water. I think I would rather have less rain now, or even a drought now, than later in the summer because there's just so much food. Like mm-hmm. you know, Sturgis said a few weeks, ago, more food than the deer can eat for sure. Yeah, at this point, I mean, it's definitely. Um, you know, we talk about deer out west, whether it's mule deer or whatever. There's definitely going to be some antler effects from this drought, right? Because they droughted early, which lack then spring growth, which then affects overall. That's what I'm saying is I don't know if there will be. Like, there's more food than the deer can eat. Like, the lack of rain, there's still soybeans out there <clears throat> and plenty of them. Mm-hmm. Around here, I don't know about out there. I don't know either. Like, the interesting stuff is, and again we haven't paid as much of attention so far this spring and summer to Kansas because we didn't get drawn. Been right. I've been watching it. But, like, they didn't plant. Yeah, just that one spot anyways. Seems really odd that they didn't plant in there, which split ear was down there the other day. I saw him in daylight. Was he? Um, but, yeah, just really odd how, how you kind of – are l- trying to follow along. I, gr- I agree. Like, I would rather not have rain now because t- typically if you get a really wet late spring, early summer, then it droughts, you're setting yourself up for EHD um, because there's all these wet mud flat spots that then dry out. Well, EHD and all those, what are the annuals? 
like what are Nebraska's annuals? Mm-hmm. Yeah, annuals will struggle, mm-hmm. and, and you and that's that's a big determining factor on your your mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, if you if you've got you know things going on with disease, you've got things going on with your food plots, like you know you don't want rain now and then no rain later. You're gonna get disease from EHD. You're gonna get brassica failure. You're gonna get clover failure. Whatever you plant, it's gonna fail if you have droughts in August September. I think it affects the West maybe more. Um, you you really hear Probably. about those guys talking about the grasslands and stuff, and because mm-hmm. if they don't get the the rain, yeah, overall, well, fires is the biggest issue. Fires right too, but yeah, that lack of moisture really <clears throat> contributes to um, mm-hmm. just the, the grass. And I assume, and again, we're just unfamiliar with it. Like some of these Dakota bottoms we're talking about that have alfalfa and stuff, uh, they have pivot I sprayers hope, yeah, and stuff I, for I irrigation. That, They're pumping it out of the river. I assume. I hope so. Yeah, I hope. And I think that would be enough mm-hmm. um, for that spot specifically. But I don't remember what it was. I mean, it's kind of weird. I don't know if we really paid attention to the weather out there going into North Dakota last year. All I know is I hope it doesn't rain when we're out there because that, that's a sloppy mess. Yeah, you're not. You need six-wheel drive because mm-hmm. you're not getting around there. That is slick as shit. Got that sharp-looking new bow sitting over there behind I know, you. I saw that. <laughs> Can I go get mine? Uh, I'm excited for you to get yours, man. It's been, I've been having a lot of fun shooting that thing, toying around with it. That's the beauty of July, man. It's all coming together and you hit July and we're 60 days out from our trip to South Dakota, North Dakota at that point. And, um, two and a half weeks, uh, months, two and a half months from now, two and a half weeks. Fuck. Yeah. Two and a half months. I know that's crazy. Well, and I, I think the exciting part now is I know some summer plots are in planning for fall plots is starting. Um, we're in, I'm on like a cycle now here. Mm, so I got beaters. Well, I got beans plant of planting anyway. So yep. I got beans planted last Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Dad cut all of our fowl plots, um, like yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I like to cut them a few weeks before spraying, mm-hmm. um, for a few different reasons. First of all, I want to cut period so that I'm not dealing with three foot tall grass, mm-hmm. um, just to get the, the disc through. But I... Don't want to cut too soon to spraying because you know glyphosate needs to activate on the on the actual surface plant area of the plant. So I All can't that thatch will lay over. Yeah, top. you can't cut and then immediately go mm-hmm. and spray. It won't work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to cut a few weeks in advance and then I'll spray probably like the first week of July mm-hmm. and then mid July all my brassicas are going in mm-hmm. which is, well and you don't want to cut too early when you got fawning and turkey nest on yep. the ground and stuff like that. So yep. yeah, I mean it's we're full swing into it. We've and I'm going to spray those beans at that time, too. So that will have been four weeks. Four weeks. I'll go back and spray our beans. We've had cameras running, but we'll, we need some attention. Actually, I'll be in Kentucky this weekend. So I'll probably go over and cut that tree up in front of that one yeah, uh, down on awesome. that bottom. We need to get feeders out down there, too. I know. I need feeders, which I we'll talked to Chris about. Um, Chris. Waiting on legs. Feeder legs. Uh, I have a 300-pounder, but it's a protein. Yeah. No. Protein. Protein. I am excited to not know what's on my farm. It's, it's, I know you've held it's off, cool at this man. Point. Yeah, I just I've been in a spirit of deprivation this year so far, like between fasting and my breathing. Maybe just don't run cameras this year. I'll run cameras or just tie them into well, my phone. The best then... part of deprivation is at the end of it, mm-hmm. indulging. <laughs> 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 yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm gonna m- much like a. St- yep. Steak and egg breakfast after a 24-hour fast. I'm going to run cameras like there's no hammer. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we got to get some cameras on Bob's, too, mm-hmm. there in Ohio. Mm-hmm. That'll be interesting. Yeah, We're going to start seeing some of our shooters, whether they hang around I, or not. You know not. what? I'm going to call him, too, and just make sure he's on the same page with, like, spraying dates. I'm going to say, hey, I'm coming out in, yeah. in this month. Do you want help? Or Because he doesn't plant brassicas till like, September, and they get, like, three inches tall. And he's like, yeah, they look great. No, go- no bueno. No bueno. No bueno, Bob. Um we're going to start seeing some shooter bucks here and whether they stick around through the season, I don't know, you know, but we'll at least start to get excited about something and they'll be in there. It's just, do they stick around till end of September, October, mm-hmm. or in the case of Kentucky, two and a half months. Mine will. They usually do. For the first week or two. <laughs> first couple of weeks, especially mm-hmm. now that I've got all those beans. Mm-hmm. It's the most beans I've ever had. Green beans. Yep. And they'll stay green. That's a solid strategy, man. I, yeah. really, I really like that. When you get, we're going to talk to Sturgis again. Well, I think he's going to come out to the farm in September sometime. Is, That's the plan. That's the plan. Yep. I'll be I'll be interested to see his his thoughts. Mm-hmm. That'll be a good one. I'm hoping we'll get him to just do kind of a free, 
consultation. Not, Pro bono. Not, I don't need a plan. Like, but he's gonna be there. Let's yeah, drive around. We'll talk. Show you what we got, yeah. and he can tell me how bad I've been. I've seen a bunch of guys talking about having like just. For one day, the guy dumps a lot of wealth and knowledge on you, and it's good, man. Just to get a second set of eyes on things that you know you've been staring at for years, um, you know, is always a really good thing. But you know, it definitely sounds like they're getting their value. But that guy's schedule is packed, mm-hmm. you know. So, well, we got a guest today, um, the first of of two on on the podcast, uh, Chris Duncan from GSM Outdoors. Chris and I have known each other for I don't know seven years, probably six mm-hmm. years. Um, back in the day, starting with Muddy and then adding Hawk and in, into the mix, and now with GSM having Stealth and Walkers and you know twenty some brands that we essentially are working with, and uh, you know Chris is one of those guys that we're envious of because he's living in Iowa. He's living in Iowa. He's killing Iowa deer. Uh, in fact, I think he we'll talk to him. I think he bought some new property in Iowa uh, that I don't know if he. I think it's brand new this year. Um, so it'll be first year he's hunting it. Which means he gets landowner tags too, uh, so that's always an attractive thing. Heck yeah! But um, can you get a landowner tag as a non-resident? Mm-mm. No, no, yeah, that has to be your primary residency. Yeah, Scott Pruka used to pull that card. Which card? I live in Iowa, but I'm in Wisconsin a lot. <laughs> Was he an Iowa resident? Uh huh. Oh, well, that's all that matters. Whatever your driver's license says. That's what it says. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of guys probably play that. Like, oh, I, I am from I Iowa, that. but I, li- I reside in Pennsylvania during the w- week. I mean, hey, whatever. As long as you're um, you're legally uh, yeah. able to show residency, that's, mm-hmm. that is, that's the catch. Well, one of the things that we used to look at, and I don't know if they've changed it, but and frankly, ask. if you've got enough, like, f- you know, to, to beat the system, you know, good for you. Well, good on you. <laughs> when Emily and I were coming out of school, we couldn't even apply for a Pennsylvania Game Commission job because we weren't residents of the state of Pennsylvania. Couldn't apply. That's like how Barack Obama became president. I need to see your birth certificate, sir. Apparently. You Hawaii reside in <laughs> SOB. <laughs> McLovin? <laughs> I am McLovin. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Very cool. Um, but yeah, so Chris is an actual Iowa, re- Iowa resident, um, you know, and so uh, obviously he's been around a lot of big bucks. Um, you know, this past year he did the the Drury stuff, um, and he's doing it again this year. Was that dream season? Yeah. So he's dream on dream season. season? Yeah, and I think it's like a, it's like a semi-live version. We'll kind of have to get... They changed the status of, or the I guess the process of how they've done that in the last year. So it's more semi-live based content, I think, in 2020. Dude, that was the was show before. back in the day. For a dream season. Yeah, I really like that. That's where uh, Rising yeah, Ben Rising. Start. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of those guys did. Mm-hmm. Pat Reeve on that too, maybe? Possibly. I think yeah, a lot of those lot guys, of guys went through that. Jeff sure. Probst, I think, was on that. Who's that? Waytail Properties. Uh, the name sounds familiar. I'm just yeah. not exactly sure who that is. From eastern, northeastern Missouri. Okay. He's like one of their number one sales guys. Gotcha. But yeah, I think a lot of guys ended up going through that that funnel of of jury dream season back in the day. I have to get an autograph from Chris here. Sign your chest. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, Sign my samurai sword. I mean, I'm not going to knock at a signature, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd have done the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think with Chris, the cool thing we'll be talking about, I know one thing that you and I've started to embrace more is around the box blind side of things. Um, you know, Muddy's got their blinds mm-hmm. out. Hawk's got a whole new set of blinds coming out. You know, it's one thing that we've looked at from a scent control, from an access standpoint, from literally placing that damn thing in the middle of the field. <laughs> to be able to get bow shots out of. And I think Chris has had a lot of success out of those box blinds too. Maybe he can answer the age old question of like, how the hell do these uh, hangers get installed? Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, yeah, Probably not. He probably doesn't know. <laughs> I don't know how they do. I, I literally looked at that thing and like went cross-eyed mm-hmm. and fell over, passed out, mm-hmm. <laughs> woke up and Started it was just like hanging out of the ceiling. Yeah. Um, Which we're going to have to figure out, dude, now that uh, we're finding out some of these mm-hmm. bow feet don't. Don't match well, up with the Hoyt limbs. I think we talked about it. We, we're going to get a couple of the Hawk box blinds this year. Okay. And put out. Cool. I think that'll be cool to 
to have those. Those have now like a limited lifetime warranty on those things because they're all metal. Yeah, they, they look pretty solidly built. I, man, the box blinds are just such a great tool. They're they're really expensive, so they're hard to justify. But um, in the right situation, they can just be deadly. Yeah, it's like anything to you, man. If you if you have the right tool to be effective at, at killing a deer, think about how much effort you pour into a season over, sure. over the course of that season or even the year. And it's like, man, if I had one or two tools that could really make me effective, if it's box blinds, if it's cell, you know, cellular trail cameras, whatever it is, you know, you're saving time and money and allowing yourself more opportunity to go out and, and do more of what you love. So. I think that'll be the interesting thing we talk about with Chris is like, if I have to say there's one tool that has changed the way I hunted, it's cellular trail cameras. 100%. Box blinds, probably quickly. They're you know, out there, too. Yeah. If I could afford them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did buy one. Yeah, I mean, I shot that buck. That's, that's the biggest buck I've ever shot right there, and I shot it on the second day of the season. And that blind's blind. still standing. You'll be able to get back in it this year, potentially kill another buck out. I mean, that's the thing is it's not like it's not like you buy it, and then it's like, okay, cool, I used it. I'll never use it again. Like, you should be using that every year. We'll, we'll have to talk to Chris here. I know we're putting him off here t too long probably, but – I'm interested to talk to him about just like the, the reality of box blinds because like they're we market them as like just pa you know palaces like a, one of them is called the palace mm -hmm. um just these amazing hunting tools and they are but it's just like anything the reality is like well bees build hives on them like mm -hmm. bugs get into <laughs> them and like do nests and yeah. like it's just funny to have to deal with that stuff yeah I'm, it's still uh I'd be a curious different. to hear some of his like real world like well here's how you deal with that and i love having it i mean it's it's an awesome thing to just have access to like whether it's like pouring down rain or if it's with the kids or whatever but yeah i mean it's just uh you know, people look at them, they're like, oh, you know, I can, like, build one. That's First of all, with the cost of lumber, you probably can't build one. That's <laughs> that's no, cheaper. Not anymore. You can't. Uh, and then to make something that lasts that long. I mean, we're talking roto-molded stuff, you know, Thermatech panels to keep heating. Like, you're not building an OSB-based box blind for that much cheaper and that will last. That thing will fall apart and rot, especially in Pennsylvania winters when it's got snow and rain well, and everything yeah, else. Yeah, just so. think about the amount of time it takes to build that thing. Like, Yeah. I mean, crap, it takes half a day to assemble and put out one of these blinds. It'll take you a week and a half to build one and put it out. And I still don't think that it's near the quality. I don't either. And probably not that much less expensive. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get him on. Bring him in. He's gone. <laughs> He had to pee already? We talked too long. <laughs> he's like, uh, I already pee. His dog's like, he's he'll be back. It looks like it's going to rain there, maybe. Maybe that's why. He's outside naked doing a rain dance. He was saying it keeps looking like, he's like, we'll get 30% and we'll get 40% and it just doesn't ever amount to anything. He said, he says it's been three weeks since it's rained there. Oh, there he is. You blew it. <laughs> How's it going? Good, man. How are you? We thought you were outside doing like a rain dance or something. I need to. We need it bad. <laughs> uh, Jared was saying it looked like it was a little breezy, like maybe there's some rain coming or something. Yeah, it just barely missed us. And it was like a very narrow band. I mm. mean, it wasn't enough to amount to much. Well, I don't think... 96 today here. Oh, yeah, that's cooking. One of the things we were talking about, Chris, and I know you you've had a lot of negative experience with it over the last few years is that it seems like when we do have maybe a, a little bit more of a wetter spring early summer and then it dries out that's when you guys get pounded with ehd um yeah. and so maybe you know glass half full a little bit dry now and what later in the year you'll get the rain you need for food plots but we won't see the ehd side of it i hope so i don't we don't need ehd anymore around here it's been bad enough when was the last big year that you had that? We had it really bad in 12, really bad in 15. And then honestly, pretty much every year since then, I've found at least some. Jeez. But the last really bad year would have been probably, probably what would have been 2000. 2018. Yeah. And that was kind of, and that was kind of sporadic because like, we've got land that we hunt in three different counties around here and there's one big piece that's 900 acres and that one was in southern monroe county and that one got completely smoked three years ago Jeez. i mean bad 
and then you could go 10 miles to the north and it was like didn't even happen fine yeah hmm. that's so that's wild cool. man that i mean that is the thing with ehd is that you'll find is like i know even when i was living in missouri in 2011 and 12 and we got hammered with it out there it was like one farm you couldn't i mean everywhere you walked there were dead box just laying everywhere you literally cross the road to somebody else's farm and it was, you, you couldn't find a dead deer, but all the bucks were still alive. Like cameras were fine. Like didn't even look like anything happened. And it was just yeah. these isolated mud flats that were housing these midges essentially. And it just, you know, wherever these deer were congregating around those mud flats, if your property had them, you were screwed, you know? And if your property didn't have them, you know, you might be fine. Why do you think um, they deal with that more in the Midwest than they do out here? There's a lot of different theories around it from like even the jet flow and like thermals and stuff like that. And it tends, is it, is it just as simple as there's more of these mud flats? Like they're, it's flatter, um, flatter land. Yeah. More agricultural based stuff, more cattle land, things like that. Any, anything that can expose that, that dirt essentially to create a mud flat. Right. And so receding cattle ponds, mass agriculture that's been tilled up and then essentially gets really wet in the spring and then dries out and creates these mud, muddy areas basically in the, late summer and early fall, you know, and we've had it here in 12, I think 15 or 16, and then maybe a little bit in 18, but like literally the Southwest corner yeah. of Pennsylvania. I mean, I can remember over the course of, you know, six years hunting our place, I mm -hmm. found two, two, two that I thought. So, yep. I mean, whatever percentage of that is you think that you would actually find, maybe say there's 10 or 15 of them and i mean you found in some of those years chris you were stumbling across a lot yeah in the 20s like and actually that was 2019 that we got smoked i'll show you guys this so this buck right there yeah that was an ehd deer and mm. it was so that was 2019 mm. and that that was that 900 acre farm and that was actually you know that farm you know now that you talk about cattle that farm was a was a cattle farm yep and the majority of that farm um, had cattle on it at some at some point. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I've read like different theories and stuff. And like I've and you probably know more about this than me. But is it true that cattle can actually carry the you know carry it in their body and then yeah and then get bit by that midge and then yep. the midge can. Yeah. So typically what it is, is it, it's, um, so it's the colocoides midge is what it is. No CMs are called biting midge, whatever you really, yeah, yeah, exactly. Dodgeball. Um, Colocoides. <laughs> and so like when you look at it, it has to, it literally has to complete the, the, the feeding cycle or the blood meal essentially as it's called. And so like if, mm. if, if it, uh, deer essentially, you know, gets bit, but like let's say these colocoides are carrying it, it can infect that deer, but it's it's the entire process of once that's infected and then another one bites on that and then that transmits it to another deer and then that transmits it. Like that's the funnel of this cycle that's actually happening. And so when you have another livestock species, in this case cattle come in, then essentially there's more bodies for these cycles to continue. How did that one specifically work out, Chris? Did you find it like the the day of? Like, how does it still have velvet? Yeah, it was actually kind of crazy. So it was it was August tenth. I don't know why I remember that day, but it was August tenth, and uh, Alex and I were driving. I remember back that day. <laughs> go check cameras. Like, I just don't know why I remember the specific date, but I do. Mm -hmm. And um, we were going to check cameras that morning, and there was a two track that you could basically go from one side of the farm to the next, and. I had one camera that was on the west side of the farm and we're pulling in. I'm like, oh crap, there's a, there's a deer floating in the pond right there. And we go up there and I could see, you know, you could kind of tell, wow. you could tell it was a buck, but you couldn't tell how big it was. So mm -hmm. I went and got a little kayak and we went out there and pulled it up and I knew exactly what deer it was. And I'm like, man, this thing is like, it just, it just died. Cause it was mid, it was like low to mid nineties that day. And yeah. I mean, wasn't even swole up or anything. No. And you know, like my cousin does taxidermy. So one of the first things you look for, if a cape's going bad is if the hair's slipping. Yep. And I mean, I could pull on the hair and nothing would come out. So especially like, being in the water, especially so, being in the water like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I called the game warden. He came out, um, gave me a salvage tag. Then went on and uh, checked the cameras well that deer at 8 30 had walked in front of a trail camera that was probably 200 yards 250 yards from the pond wow and 
we found him at 10 15 in the morning That's so nuts. he he had literally just been dead and it did not take him long like I, he 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 had died sometime between probably 8 45 and 10 15. Mm, that's so crazy we talked about this with um bronson from mississippi state deer lab around the tolerance that that a lot of the deer in the south because it's it's an every year occurrence right warmer weather mud flats like that's one of the reasons we don't see it as much um in the northeast at least is that the highest prevalence of of ehd is late august but really early september like right around labor day through like the 15th yeah. like that's tending to be I the can, peaks i of can it. feel it too like yeah. you can always feel it, like when it's not been raining and stuff it's like ugh. well and we've been feels EHD. and what we're craving is like a frost because those hard frosts are the, yeah. the like it'll kill off all those midges it's over right and so like when you're in the midwest and especially because of the way that a lot of those you know jet streams work and stuff like chris is obviously going to be 96 today we're going to be like 75 today or something like it tends to continue to filter warmer weather through the great plains through iowa up into the dakotas you know later especially into uh early september indian summer type weather right that it just continues to go and go and go but then all of a sudden it'll just fall off like uh, you, it'll go from 90 degrees one day in iowa to like oh it's gonna be a high 50 and it's gonna be 32 tomorrow night you know and freeze happens and frost happens and you're done so you know, and the bad thing that, that really sucks about it is like, I, I read and hear about, okay, you know, immunity to it and mm -hmm. whatever else. And it's like that same year. So 2019, this buck was in a bachelor group with three other bucks all summer. And one of those deer, uh, we know was at least eight and a half years old. We had five Jeez. years photos of him. So he, he went through, um, he went through a handful of, you know, a few other you know, years of EHD and he made it through that mm -hmm. and then he's seven, seven or eight years old. And then it wipes him out, you know? So it's like, I don't know. It's, it's pretty frustrating. Obviously you guys have been there and dealt with it. We've dealt yep. with it a lot down here. We deal with it, you know, down here in Southern Iowa, but then you can go to Northeast Iowa and they have zero cases. Never happened. You get it. Yep. Uh, wow. Another thing that, you know, you brought up the hard freeze, mm -hmm. the hard freeze thing. Right? And I, and I, I do think that rings true the majority of the time, but in 2012, it would have been the first week of November in 2012. It got up to like a, I mean, it was like mid seventies, like crazy warm for that time of year for probably five, six days. And that was the year we got hit super hard down there. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it warmed up, people started finding, you know, dead bucks again. We had Jeez. a bunch of high load that he made it through all summer and we're like, Oh man, thank God he made it. You know, it's stud of a deer. And, and then all of a sudden it warms up and, you know, he made it through shedding velvet and he's there during the rut. He's chasing does. We get him on camera and then boom, I'm walking down a Creek and had him on camera two days before. And we find him laying there dead. And I called the game warden that time too, to get a salvage tag. And he's like, dude, I just started taking calls again. Um, wow. Finding fresh dead deer. Was that the same year that, um, you remember Bill had that giant buck diet? Was yeah, it Bubba? Bubba. That was the same year. Yep. Same year. Yep. yep. And that's when I was in Missouri. Same deal. That was finding hard, hard. all the, finding all those deer. I was, I was actually bow hunting opening day. Missouri was September 15th. And I had two of the bucks that I was trying to hunt. And this was in public land in Missouri. I had on camera like the day before went into that stand and it's like nine o'clock and I'm like, man, like I smell like I smell a dead deer. And I, we had been finding them all summer. I walked over and one of the bucks I had on camera was right there dead in the, in the Creek. And it's like, wow. what are you going to do? You know, you can't do anything about it, but you're right. I mean, as soon as it warms back up, these mud flats house those larvae and those, those midges in there. So as soon as it warms up the ability for those to kind of repopulate themselves and, and essentially have an effect on deer, can happen at any time and it's just it's like sad just think about you know the deer just dying so, just falling in the pond and it's just dead like yeah i mean it sucks for the deer and it's I mean, it's like it's a hard to be a deer and mm -hmm. it's also not that we really matter nearly as much but like to see them grow to, sure. to potential and then get ripped out from under you before the season even starts in a lot of cases it's like man it's just the worst case scenario for all parties involved yeah well it, put a ton of time and money into managing for them and growing for them and 
you know, it, it ultimately, like I've, from a research facility wise, like I've watched a lot of these deer get infected and I've seen some that are just like, man, like that deer's dead on its feet and like they'll mm-hmm. recover from it. And that's typically in the South. Like I, I would bet that most of the deer that get infected with it in the Midwest and North are dead. Like it's, it's a death wish. Um, there are probably some that make it through. There are probably some that just don't get infected and, and make it through. Like probably in the case of like that wide load, Chris, and that like he probably just lucked out and and made it through, you know, and then he gets hit and it's a death wish. Um, I still think though, like, you don't think we should have these deer wearing masks? Yeah, no masks. They're not going to (laughs) work. Dr. Anthony what about, Fauci coming out talking about deer EHG. I think, we, yeah, social, <laughs> some social distancing might go a long way yeah. with these deer. Yeah, there goes my so, mineral sites. One thing I find interesting, and I don't know if it, maybe it was just there, we weren't out in the woods as often back then, but the first time I had ever heard about it here in Southern Iowa was 2008. Mm-hmm. That was the first time I had ever heard about it. I'm like, what is this? And, and we found one that year right by a pot and i'm like oh okay this is what it is but you know it was like one deer and then literally i didn't hear about it or i never saw it again until 12 yeah now since 12 it's been well, literally it, consistent not crazy you know besides 19 it was pretty hard in that one area down there but yeah it just it's like i never heard about it before it is very cyclic base i mean I, i've heard that in the past from just like any insect uh population obviously we're dealing with whatever cicada x this year right that it's very cyclic base and and how it kind of forms it was uh i think it was 2008 when i dealt with it in mississippi at the research facility i mean we got hammered and we were losing deer a lot of deer from it and that was my first experience with it and then 12 was the year that seemed like everybody like that that to me was the introduction to most of the whitetail range like the Midwest, you know, up to Southwest Pennsylvania, Ohio, like all of a sudden everybody's talking about like, Hey man, we're just finding deer everywhere dead. And it's like, yeah, this is, this is EHD, right? This is what it is. And then, yeah, it, it definitely is weather dependent. You know, if we have those wet springs or in, and late or early summer wet areas, and then they kind of dry out and we have, we've dealt with that even in the last two or three years, you know, it seems like we're just consistently like, it's wet in the spring and then it's like cool time to plant food plots and there's no rain <laughs> like yeah. for for months that, at that's a time. why i was kind of making the case earlier that like i there's more food right now than the deer can eat like r- rain or not and i just think that um at, at least in the for sure in the east probably in the midwest i, I think in the west they probably struggle a little bit more but then like later when ehd is is really a risk and when mm-hmm. we're planting annuals which are critical for our hunting season we need rain at that time. Mm -hmm. So I'd almost rather have it the way it is now than yeah, flip flop. As long as the spigot turns on at some point. Yeah. As long as we get rain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to get rain at some point. How how do your crops look out there, Chris? Like beans coming up and stuff. I got everything in yet or. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it depends on the time they were planted, but you can definitely tell that they're stressed right now. Yeah. Um, We need rain really bad. It's been, you know, it's all like when you look at the state of Iowa in general, the majority of the state is in, you know, some type of a drought right now. Hmm. Some places more severe than others. Um, but like the corn on on our farm, it's probably maybe a foot tall, which it, it can grow really quick. But I mean, it yep. definitely needs rain. And, you know, like I'm used to seeing it used to be like they'd say knee high by the 4th of July. Well, that's that was like 30 years ago because now I've seen it clear up yeah clear up yeah Mm -hmm. but um yeah farmers are a little bit nervous right now and they're we're definitely needing rain luckily there's some in the forecast but it's like when you go so long without rain and then you get like a 50 percent chance Mm -hmm. okay well yeah just it it seems like certain farms too my farm is one of them unfortunately i've seen several 100 percent not happen Mm-hmm. Yeah, just depending on where you're. Hundred percent chance of rain, or you and get, a lot of it, and it's like, yep. Yeah, you know, or you get happened. these drought periods, and then all of a sudden you just get like a torrential downpour. Well, it just runs off. Yeah, like you need a soaker. You need it to like actually sit there and like and have a good long day. Yeah, but that's just how it is. Well, Chris, you so you just bought a farm, right? Was that this year? Yeah, we just actually closed on it like probably three weeks ago, and it's a farm that we've hunted now for this will be our fourth year so we're familiar with it mm-hmm. uh, my, who's we chris who's we, who's we 
my wife and I. Your wife and you. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. Have so, you killed bucks on it in the past? I've never killed a buck on it. Really? Nope. I've never killed. Sounds a like a risky there's investment. Always, <laughs> there's, always, uh, there's always some good ones on it. Yeah. It's just, you know, like I've, I've, it's kind of weird because that farm, I just haven't put a ton of time into it. Mm-hmm. It's a really good farm in a really good area, but that going back to that 900 acre farm, they got hit with EHD all the time. That thing was like the easiest farm in the world to hunt. And I don't, I don't have that lease anymore. Yeah. Uh, but that thing was wide open with just, you know, it you go to the North a mile and it's just giant hardwoods and big timbers and guys that were managing like crazy. And then this 900 acres sat to the South of it, wide open pastures with little ditches and draws. And there was always big deer there. And I just knew, okay, well I'll wait until it's, they're moving hard mm-hmm. and um, go down there and, and I'd hunt there most often, uh, most of the time, but this place will be different now it sets up where it'll be really good from, you know, now that I own it and I can put box blinds on and I can put food plots where I want and I can put screening where I want to get in and out of it with access. I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun and it'll set up really well to hunt. Um, once we get everything dialed in before here, before the season starts. Well, that'd be cool. So it, you were saying about the, the corn, do you have corn on that right now? Is it, is yeah. there some crop ground? Yeah. So that this farm is um, it's, 50 acres and then i i have sole access to the north side so this guy owned 100 acres he didn't want to sell the north half yet um but in the purchase agreement we got the south 50 and then i have sole access to the north 50 with um we put in there which i don't know how much it would hold up if it really got down to but we have last right of refusal to basically if he ever wants to sell it Mm -hmm. if we don't agree with the price he would have to bring a buyer in that you know, had us, they agreed upon a price and then we could match it, which there you go. I don't see getting to that point. Um, it, he, him and I are, you know, we, we've known each other for quite a while. Like I said, sure. I hunted there for four years. So he wants to see us have it because he knows that we like that area. And mm-hmm. obviously we just bought 50 acres there. Very cool. Uh, so the farm is, if you take the whole hundred, it would be probably 40 ag and then 60% uh, cover. That's pretty good in your area. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a neat area. It's a neat farm. Um, like I said, it's in a really good area. It's like going back two years ago. The reason I didn't kill a deer there was I was hunting 200 and before he broke his brow tiny he would have been about 210. I remember I that there on that farm. And I hunted him for basically three weeks when he was not there. <laughs> and I, was, I knew he was very, very close, but I yeah. had him. Like Interesting strategy, off. Cotton. <laughs> we'll see how it works out <laughs> for him. <laughs> But it was like early, it was like October. He shows up, and I'm, I go, "Holy crap! This deer is huge." Yeah, and I mean, he, I killed a deer once at uh, 28 and a half inch main beams. My biggest deer I've ever killed. He's low 180s, and I go, "Man, this deer makes that one look like a baby." Oh my god! And you got a picture of that? Type, it was a type of typical that you don't get to hunt very often. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, people think of Iowa and they think that there's just giants everywhere, and that's pretty far from the truth. See, I mean, Jared. You, you, do you have a, can we see a picture of him? Is he dead now or? He's dead. Yeah. I'll pull a pic and see if I can find it. Did somebody picture. kill him that year, Chris? Yeah. It's quite the story. So, so <laughs> I. We'd like to hear it. We started hunting him. Um, it was like October 24th and he was there. And this is this I, on the 900? No, this is on the farm I just bought. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeans. Yeah. So. I started hunting that deer like October 24th and I would get like, I had some cell cams up and I was getting some daylight photos of him. Like, okay, it's time now. So I went in there and hunted him. And then I had some daylight of him like the first of November. I'm like, okay, it's just a matter of time. And then I started hunting like him pretty hard. And I was being conservative though, like more conservative than I, than I usually am. Mm -hmm. Usually pretty aggressive. And I was being conservative and kind of hanging out on the edge and just, just not doing what I typically do, but I just didn't want to mess this deer up. And, um, and then all of a sudden he just vanished. Like there was two weeks where he was gone, like from November 7th until the day before Thanksgiving. Mm. And did you think at that point he was dead? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know for sure. I didn't think he was dead because I would probably would have heard about it. I know enough people in that area and big enough deer to hear about it. Yeah. So then all of a sudden it was Thanksgiving and he shows up. And that year, the whole west side, or sorry, the east side of that farm was all standing corn. And so this is two years ago, and it had been pretty wet. So the farmer 
could not get in there to, to harvest mm-hmm. that corn. So I called him and he just, he's my stepdad. And I, most guys would probably be like, you're an idiot. You're not going to do this. But I'm like, dude, this deer just showed up again. I go, I am going to pay you back for this, but I am going to drive my truck through this corn, <laughs> get down to this, this back cove area where I knew that deer was bedding off the side. I'm just going to run. I'm just going to drive my truck around, knock this corn down and tuck a blind in. I'm going to leave. And I go, I'll pay you for the corn that I'm ruining and knocking down. He's like, yeah, whatever. That's yeah, sure. So I did that. And I put two cell cams on each corner and I'm like, there's no way this deer can. And it was probably from the blind in the center of the plot. It was probably 40 yards to the right, 40 yards to the left and probably 50 yards forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, he walks out into this knockdown corn. He's going to get an arrow Mm -hmm. and, um, put two cell cams up and then boom, he started showing up and it got to the point where it was like clockwork, but it was always, you know, an hour to 30 minutes before shooting light. And then he would always leave before the sun came up. Mm. And I'm like, man, <laughs> I, I went and hunted him a handful of times and I made, you know, I would walk from the road through the standing corn to my ground blind and like had a perfect wind and he just never came out, but then I'd leave. And then he'd be there 30 minutes later. I'm like, dude, this deer is so close to dying. <laughs> and long story short, I'm like, well, I'm going to kill him with a, with a gun now. Like it's going to get cold. He's here. Yeah. I've got tons got, of food. Exactly. Like, gloves are off. Yeah. I ended up like paying my stepdad for three acres of standing corn and, and I moved a box blind into the back and I'm like, okay, well, it's just a matter of time. I'm going to kill the biggest deer of my life. What did that set you him. back? But I'm just curious. What's that? What did that set you back? Three acres of corn? Uh, obviously depends on the year, but I think that was like 600 bucks an acre. So yeah, eighteen hundred makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's pretty so, good. Yeah, that's I've heard. I've heard around, around. You know, it's the it's the 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 morning of first shotgun, and so like what I do is like I'll wake up and like that's when every Tom, Dick, and Harry from mm-hmm. Central Ohio or from everywhere will just mm-hmm. be out there pushing deer and doing yep. deer drives and like guys that you know, there's a lot of good shotgun groups. And then there's some shotgun groups that they don't care about property lines. They don't care about anything. They're going to go wherever they want. Mm -hmm. And that that just drives me nuts. But what I'll do is I'll go, you know, basically patrol certain areas and just. Isn't that crazy that you have to sacrifice your opening day to patrol basically versus like actually hunt? (laughs) Well, so that's the thing in Iowa, you have, if you're not a landowner, which I wasn't at the time. Oh, you weren't at the time. Yeah. The first gun season's five days the second gun season's nine days. And what I was going to do was the first, I wasn't going to risk it for five days and it was kind of warm. Uh-huh. So I was going to wait until either second gun or late muzzle to make it. Gotcha. Okay. So long story short, I'm driving around and I get a phone call from the neighbor and he's like, Hey, uh, what's going on? And not much. I thought he was just calling to just talk to me about, yeah, you know, random stuff, see anybody out, whatever. And he goes, Hey, um, Leonard shot that giant deer last night. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And I had a photo of, the, of that deer at, it was like five in the morning, um, leaving the, the knockdown corn. And he's like, and they're, they're across the road to the South. I mean, it's a good three quarters of a mile. Huh. So he goes, he goes, yeah. He's like, it was the last morning of both seasons. So the day before I had a photo of that deer walking off the plot, they, they put, um, they had a food plot. They own like, they're great guys and they own like 2,500 acres and they manage hard. They're part of the reason that there's good. Yeah. Big deer around. And they, uh, they had a cell cam that was basically on a, on the gravel road where all the, a lot of deer would cross and that deer had not been there. That's where that deer went during the rut where I lost him for two weeks. He went across. Yeah. Then he came back and then they lost him, but they knew he was around. So they wanted to make sure they knew when he was coming back. So boom, that deer shows up at like 7 a.m. on the, the, that last day of bow season, jumping the fence, going into their stuff. So he's like, well, I got to hunt there tonight. It's the last day of bow season. So they had a box blind, food plot, whatever, and they set up, and he and he kills this deer. Holy and shit. He's an official scorer for, uh, you know, Pope and Young, yep. or whatever. And it scored uh, 190, it grossed 198, but it probably had – six inches of brow broke off and then like a four inch dagger. Oh, wow. He would have, he would have been right around 210 probably. All right. I got to see a picture. Let me find it. Hold on. I've seen one. I think I saw it at the time, but I, it's been a while. Mm, When when was that last year? 
two years ago. Two years. Wow. That's a giant. He was one of those deer where, like, you know, you'd show people the photo, and they're like, oh, that deer's big. You know, he's like one, 180s, 190. I'm like, I'm telling you, this deer's bigger because. Yeah, just monster. Did you know him from the year previous, Chris? No, no. neither did they. No shit. <laughs> well, neither one of us did. And uh, they actually got, they, they age every deer. They send their teeth in, and it came back uh, as five and a half. So and just moved in. Because his head and his whole body was just like gigantic. And I'm like, this mm. deer's got to just be. Wow. Isn't that crazy that you could have a five and a half year old buck like that that just shows up and everybody's like, yeah, I don't know who he is. Yeah, I've had that too. Like at our farm, I have a mature buck show just up move and I'm in. like, where the heck did this thing come from? Never seen him before. It's real weird. I think there's something to those uh, herd dynamics mm-hmm. that when certain. I, I thought this was going to be the deer that I, that I killed, man. Like, I've never had a deer where I'm like, okay. Well, it sounds like he was, I won't say killable, but he gave you plenty of opportunities in daylight. Yeah, I should have probably been more aggressive looking back. But then I was like, I was also telling myself, well, I know I'll kill him with a gun. Yeah. I I just don't want to. I I should have been more aggressive. You just don't want to screw it up. You can see him standing next to what's probably a two-year-old in this photo. And, like, look at the body size. Dude. (laughs) Hmm. I mean, he had one main beam that was 29 inches. Oh, my God. Wow. That's it's deceiving. Toad. Dude, he's in person. I agree. I, I would have said, yeah, he's probably 180-something. That's what I thought, but then I was looking at I just kept dissecting the photos, and I was comparing it to that 182. <laughs> the longer I looked at it, the bigger he got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I, got some I wish that strategy worked with everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I'll find a I'll find a uh, video of it. No, that's cool. It, and and while you're looking for that, I want to kind of use this as like a good transition point. But uh, and I know I fall. Yeah, that's Ooh. ridiculous. Yeah, that's a pig. Is that wow. that kicker in the front right there that he broke yeah, off? He broke that off and he broke the. Oh. Oh. Do you got a you got a like a grip and grin picture of him from those guys or? I. I probably do, um, but he probably doesn't want his face shown. Okay, I actually, yeah, no I worries. I his name already, but he's Amish. No worries. I, I forgot it already. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, I, he took it to the Deer Classic, so he probably doesn't care. But I don't know if I've got one or not. You know, one of the interesting things about it, and I, I use this as like a real good one from last year with me and that that buck on the mountain that was probably in the one seventies that I've been hunting for a while. Is like, do you think knowing you had the information from your cell cam, Chris? Do you think that like, I know I've been way more conservative, which has benefited in some cases, but it's also hurt me or I've missed opportunities in other because I'm literally hunting via that, like that information. So I'm not being as aggressive because I'm like, oh, he's coming to this area. I'll just hunt here versus like instinct. I'm like, man, I should push in Wait, there. Well, dude, here's something before you answer that, Chris, there's something to be information alone. Watch him turn. Hold on. Sorry to interrupt you. Watch You're him fine. turn his head. That's, this is when you're in to see how big he is. Oh, oh my man. God. <laughs> yeah, that's a toad. Yeah, that's a mega. Oh, it still gives me nightmares oh. thinking about it. The one that got they just away. don't make very many like it, you know? No. That's so cool, that, though, that he's on that property, dude. Yeah, that's insane, oh, man. Wow. Oh, my God. He broke that, dag- that dagger off. Yeah, and yeah. that brow. He didn't, break, he didn't break either one of them off till literally, like, it was late November. Yeah, it was it was after Thanksgiving. I think th- they do a lot of fighting post lock. Well, I mean, dude, the genes are there. I mean, you just bought a farm where yeah. that deer has some seed somewhere out there. There's really good seed. genetics there for big typicals. Um, you know, one thing that's really cool about this area is the neighbors are. You got those guys to the south that I told you about, mm-hmm. and they're they're good. And then you've also got you know landowners around it that they just there's very minimal hunting that goes on. Yeah, that's really cool. So I mean, that's key. About age, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, it's all about age. And one thing I've seen in Iowa is like, we've got a lot of deer in these highly managed areas mm-hmm. that are hitting 170 when they're four and they're getting shot and they're yep. studs. And you're yep. on, they're big deer. But it's almost like, I've almost started to like, not that the area I just bought this farm is, is it managed? But you look at like, four sides or three sides of it and it's not managed Mm -hmm. it's not plots there's not guys sitting in box blinds with custom muzzleloaders where and and four acres of like i do where there's going to be a deer walk out and you're going to be able to kill it you know Mm -hmm. um so you're getting deer that 
are really good deer that kind of sneak through the cracks and then all of a sudden you get a five you know that this deer i don't know what he was at four i would venture to say he was probably 170 i mean yeah never well but i would say probably there's a good chance he was yeah and he was a really good deer but he made it through and he got to five mm-hmm. yeah i feel like and don't get me wrong like obviously so, there's there's a majority of deer here when they get to five or six they're never going to break 160 they won't yeah mm-hmm. um but then you get those like elite level deer with just have the perfect genetics to to really blow up and they're they're getting killed when they're four years old four years old yeah so but th- but anyways going back i get uh, this area is a really cool area it's got good genetics it's just we gotta like we gotta just keep getting these deer older mm-hmm. and give them the chance to get big and then also on the other hand you know there's there's some deer on this farm that they're not going to score that much and mm-hmm. they're they're old they're five six year old deer there's one deer that's like he came by alex last year and i mean this thing is the biggest turd of a deer in the world it's like <laughs> not like a, you know it's basically no brow tines and then this side's like a g2 and a main beam and then this side's like a three point he's a seven eight, well he's five pointer mm-hmm. Jeez. It, it's like out, he came right up into a decoy like beat the hell out of the decoy at mm-hmm. 12 yards i'm like Alex, you know, when he's coming in, I'm like, you're going to shoot that. She's like, no, I don't want to shoot that deer. And that's a deer that's kicking the shit out of like high quality three-year-olds and stuff. Yeah. And pushing deer off Mm -hmm. and breeding does and whatever else. And so like this year, like that's one of our top hit list deer. And there's going to be some deer on this farm that, you know, we're going to let go that are nice, very nice deer, but we're trying to get these deer to five plus. Yeah. So is this your first stab at a landowner tag this year then, Chris? Yes, this is the first That's- piece of land we bought, and you know it's been ever since I was a kid. You know I dreamed about owning my own piece, and although yeah. it's not a huge piece of land, it was like everything we we had to get the funds together to buy this for yeah, sure. Yeah. So well, dude, and how cool you know, is that in Iowa that like you're you're not giving up your tag to now? It's like I've got a new farm and I get a tag with it. Mm-hmm. Does your wife get one as well? No it's it'll just be- <laughs> so wait who gets the tag how does that work <laughs> i don't know the details of it i just know right now i'm the only one that gets land on <laughs> I, like, I don't know if you can like break it up and be like oh well yeah you know well, like if her name's on the mortgage property. does she also get a i think you get one per property is isn't that how not per property though because it's weird because it's like i own 50 acres and yep. i'm gonna get one landowner tag right well then my buddy eldon and Monroe County owns 3,000 acres, and he gets one landowner tag. Yeah. Right. It's got to be by individual, not property. Yeah. I, it's, not, it's not by property, but, like, you know, I don't know how that works if, like, someday we buy another farm. Yeah, do you, you know, get another landowner tag? It should be as simple as whose farm is the name in. If it's in both of yours, you should both be able to get tags. No, they don't do it like Just that. Just one. Yeah. Because I know, so Bill did this, right? I mean, Bill would always kill, what, three? Yep, three. Three bucks? Because he would have two tags and a landowner tag. And a landowner tag. Get an early, uh, late, a late muzzleloader and a. Yeah. So his bow tag, then he'd get a landowner tag, then he'd have his late muzzleloader tag, which he would bow hunt usually for yep. as well. Yep. Yeah. So, so I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs. Like I said, I'm brand new to the whole thing. I haven't even. That's cool though, the man. Documentation yet to, to get those landowner tags. But I'm, I, I don't, you know, this farm's only 50 acres. There's no way I'll ever. Yeah. I'll never kill three bucks there. Sure. Um, no, well, like but you can still keep hunting, keep hunting the places you have been hunting, and just add a landowner tag with your new farm. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yep. Or and if you try to target one of those old, I was gonna say if you've got those like scrub old mature bucks, like kill those. Yeah, at least but, you've yeah. got the tag in, in your pocket, given the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's an interesting thing we were talking. You, you kind of mentioned like how you're trying to get those bucks to be older and stuff. Like obviously, and we beat on this a lot on this podcast, but the the pressure is such a big killer of these deer. And, you know, like even this year, you know, first time in my hunting career, I didn't get drawn for Kansas. And it sounds like now that we're learning more about it is like, man, like a lot of people didn't get drawn for Kansas. And it's just, it was an overwhelming wave of applications this year. In fact, I think I could say this. So these guys we're talking to later today Mm -hmm. called me beforehand and they're like, Hey, can we, let's just not talk about Kansas. I was like, yeah, no, that's fine. Whatever. And he's like, yeah, we just, you know, like we, we're the only ones we know of. Uh, and we know a lot of guys that they got for drawn. Kansas that got drawn. Yeah. And I mean, we will next year cause we'll have preference points. They blame Chris B. 
That's funny. <laughs> Which I'm sure didn't help, but I'm sure it didn't. It's walk, not, I mean, walk it's not in small, only, but walk yeah, in only a got a ton of giant. Yeah, got a ton of Yeah, it's well, even some of these outfitters are really so I talked to yep. Scott's outfitter. He said three quarters of the guys that hunt an outfitter every year didn't get drawn. And now that outfitter's like well, now what? Like, do I have to go find new clients? Because, like, these guys just came every year. It was just part of it. It was automatically booked. And it's – so it's one of those things – we talked about it last week. Is it, like – is it a w- overwhelming amount of crossbow hunters that are coming in because they can now – you know, they apply during the archery season and stuff? Is it just an overwhelming amount of hunters in general? I, d- I don't know. Yeah. I, I th- what's, the, what's the quota there? Do you guys know? Like, how do they do that? Yeah, it's it's by um, it's by unit. So, like, our units, we hunt are 12 and 14. And it's, like, I think 14 has 2,400 non-resident bow tags. Um, and normally it's, like, or maybe it's 1,900 and the other one's so far. Anyways, normally it's, like, 200 to 300 people over that for applications that and that don't end up getting drawn. It sounds like this year was almost double. I wonder if those stats are available online yet. I don't. I bet they are. You want to see if you can find that, Ian? Yeah. Can you find out? Can I, um, can I grab some more copy quick? Yeah, yeah do that, it, man. Before I do that, that's like I'm going to pee right now. Iowa with saving grace is the fact that we do limit non-residents. Hundred yeah. percent. Well, dude, your state does probably the best job at managing. I mean, Jared and I are on point number three for Iowa. Yep. Yeah. You know, we yep. still probably have. Well, you and I talked about it, Chris. What do we got? Two more years. Yeah, you'll have two more years. It'll be five years for Zone Five, and and it is it, it's actually creeping too. But like, where's Zone you, Five? You, South Central. I, you look at Iowa in general, and I mean Iowa. There's maybe a third of it that I would call quality deer hunting. Mm-hmm. A third of Iowa is quality deer hunting. Don't get me wrong. There's a few pockets in these areas that you know I consider not quality that you might be able to have some luck. But yeah. you know, even six thousand non-resident tags over one third of Iowa is it's a lot. Not, it's not bad. I mean, it's not too much. It's not, I mean, it's about perfect and it's kind of funny how it all worked out, but, um, it, it's, it's definitely, I was saving, saving grace. And as soon as we ever lift that, if it ever does happen, which I hope and pray it never happens. I mean, you'll see the quality of the state just yeah, drop fall through. Right. Well, that's my worry with Kansas is like, yeah, I, I put Kansas and Iowa very close together in terms of quality of deer that we're seeing coming out of both states. You know, and again, there's pockets, right? We're in southeast Kansas, which I feel like is the honey hole for Kansas, especially. But if all of a sudden, like, it's it's getting completely flooded in those areas, and they have barriers on there, 1,924. But if they ever say, eh, you know, let's just open up to 3,000 and 2,500, you had another 600 hunters in some of these areas. And, I mean, it will we'll start not seeing the 180 to 200 inch deer that we have. Yeah, that's have. the exact wrong way to go about it. In fact, I, I'd be in more favor of... Uh just make it more difficult to access all of these places. If I had to wait two, three years to hunt Kansas every year, yeah, it sucks right now because that hasn't been the case in the past, but I'd be willing to do that. And to offset, I was like, okay, I'm just going to start putting in for Oklahoma and Wisconsin. And I'm just going to have, you know, a multitude of these places that we're, you know, trying to get opportunities following. And, and over time they will, and the deer there will get bigger because, you know, not only are people hunting them less, but hunters are probably off their game because they don't get to go, to the same lease every year or, mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, th- things happen. So I'd, I'd be in favor of that. Why don't you get, I mean, I would be fine if, if I moved, I would, I would be fine with the rules. I would be fine if the Iowa DNR came to us and said, Hey, you guys, instead of a two buck state, it's a one buck state. Yeah. I would be oh, dude, I would that would no issue with that as a resident. I mean, I, I, I want what's best for our deer herd and I would be yeah. completely fine with that. Like <laughs> this year, you know, now that I'm a landowner, I get three buck tags. Well, you know, like Eldon, who's been a landowner down here since the early nineties buying ground. I couldn't tell you at one time he's filled three buck tags. Right. Yeah. So, so I, and I, you know, like the whole two buck tag thing, even with that being said, the majority of guys I know aren't mm-hmm. even filling both every single year. They're pretty picky. Yep. EHD is killing way more deer. If we could ever figure out how to get rid of EHD, our quality would just be. Yeah. Through the roof. Rough. Yeah. We, had, we had a really interesting, I know we got to go here in a minute, but I had a really, we had a really interesting conversation with the PA game commission guy, uh, like a week or two ago mm-hmm. about like factors they're looking at in how they allocate tags. Like, is it, you know, money is certainly a part of it. It's like, you know, how much money do we need to make? Mm-hmm. It's also about hunter opportunity in this state seems to outweigh hundred percent herd quality. That's you know? all they care about is opportunity for yeah. the hunter. And we're, we, because of the number, we'll always be a one buck state. 
which is why I don't buy a, a tag here. Which is interesting, though, because, I mean, I think Ohio uh, has made a huge push recently against Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, because they are a one-buck state. I think yes. some of the reason you're seeing bigger bucks coming out of Ohio is that they are a one-buck state. Well, I don't know if it's a push as much as it just always has been that. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, I think that as you start to look at the raising the price of tags, well, out it's there just too. the number of hunters and stuff and what you get going on that side. Okay. So, P, yep, do you find that? Uh, look at Ken. huh? That's right. crazy. Yeah, Ian's gonna bring this up for us, Chris, to uh, sure. to look at. But we found the stats. It yeah, way up. So, um, unit fourteen is us. Uh, there's 1,924 tags issued non-resident, 2,689 put in for first choice. So over 700 people got declined. Wow. Uh, unit 12 is our other one, 2,200 issued, 3,247. So over 1,000 people got denied. Those numbers have never been at that level. Where is... um? There's your bottoms there. 22,000 total issued, 29,880 first choice. So over 7,000 people, almost 8,000 people got rejected this year. Oh, wow. And it's never been like Where's that. Where's unit 11? That seems to have the most applicants. Uh, Kansas City, I think, area. And usually they give you, like, if we issue in 14, they'll give you 11 automatically because it's urban, suburban area. Um, but, hey, yeah. At least we're guaranteed for next Those year. Those are stats. I, I mean, everywhere, right? You scroll up, Ian. So how, do you know how many total non-residents they allow in their state? 22,000. 22,000. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's scroll down. So look at that bottom one. 18 is the only one. There basically was one person who didn't get drawn. Other than that, that's, it was that's astronomically crazy, different. That's crazy, though, man. Like, they're sti they're, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's still a pretty high percentage of draw. Yeah, 8,000 uh, people didn't get drawn. I mean, that's not that bad. I mean... Mm hmm. Good math. 25%. So 75% success rate. But go back to I started in 2013. It was 100% in 2013. 2014, it was near 100%. And then now we're down to 75. In five or six years, we've dropped 25% in success rate. Yep. Iowa used to be that. I mean, there's one of my buddies from PA that bought, uh, I think he owns maybe 400 acres here. Yeah. He bought, he bought that back. Um, he started hunting here in the nineties and like the mid nineties and he could bow hunt every year, every year, mm. every single year. And so he's like, Oh, I want land here. So then he bought land, you know, I think it was probably right around 2000. Mm -hmm. I think at that point he told me it was every other year, or two out of three years or whatever. And now it's like, man, now it's every five every or five six. Years. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds uh, like <clears throat> that late muzzleloader is still different right like because there's a guy around here that goes he says he draws every other year to go hunt iowa for that late month yeah so season. so they take six thousand tags mm -hmm. six thousand non-resident tags and 65 percent of those are are only allocated to gun hunters oh wow 30, another 35 percent is allocated to archery hunters wow you'd almost think it'd be reversed i don't know i don't know why when that rule there's just probably happened. way more gun hunters just period yeah. You would think your bow hunters would pay more though to go there than a gun hunter. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's because you know it was like the family tradition type thing and sure. kids leave the farm and they move and they Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, I don't know. Um Wow. I would say just just period. I mean mm -hmm. I mean I, I do think that barring the multi buck resident stuff that you guys have and Missouri still has like I was got it down. Like the fact that you're going to make me wait five years as a non-resident to come and bow hunt that area. And I mean, I could get in, in some other places earlier or different seasons earlier. Like there's some threshold that's, it's going to be at least three years on average. I suppose it does. It does seem really tipped in the resident's favor, which I mean, if I was a resident, I'd be all about it. But as, sure. a, as a non-resident, it's like, man, residents get to hunt, kill three bucks and I have to wait five years to go out and, do you think you start to see this in other states like Illinois? We're hunting Illinois this year. That's over the counter. Do you think you start to see at some point, you know, I, I guess a regulation of what? I, I think once on once the state starts on getting, once they start getting that money, it's hard to turn it around. That's what know? I would say. I mean, there's still plenty of opportunities. Don't get me wrong, but like, you know, at some point, uh, if you look at and again, uh, 
the shitty part that we have here is like we can't we keep going back to like Boone and Crockett like re, you know records for like quality of deer and like Buffalo County and Wisconsin still number one. It's like well, how many people actually check a Boone and Crockett deer anymore? Like nobody, mm-hmm. nobody I know. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, we don't care. Yeah. So like those records are only as good as as the data coming in, but you know, you look at kind of where these states are falling and like Wisconsin's number one, Iowa, I think it's like number three or four now on there. Uh, Kansas is in like the top five, Missouri's like maybe number two, Minnesota's still up there, but it, it, I feel like that data is just skewed, right? We can't go by that data. I, I'm sure if you looked at the County, like they're still killing big bucks, mm-hmm. but in terms of who's best, nobody cares anymore to, oh. to submit it to a book caliber. Yeah. Um, There's just so many variables. I mean, you look, like I said, you look at the state of Iowa and two thirds of the, well, yeah, two thirds of the state aren't good for deer hunting. Right. I, I was going to mention and then you go to like Ohio and Ohio is, you know, predominantly good deer hunting. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, a lot of has, it. More, has more good huntable acres than Iowa does. Um, mm-hmm. Jason from Ultimate Outdoors. Yeah. He's got a lease in southwestern Iowa. Mm hmm. And uh, I asked him if he's gone on any trips this year, and he's like, yeah, I'm still waiting to see. Apparently, your drawings are not in yet. It's, it should be, like, any day now. Any day now. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he just didn't seem that excited about it. He's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, he's like, it's all right. He's like, it's not great deer hunting. I was like, what do you mean? It's, it's Iowa. And he's like, yeah. He's like, it's just yeah. kind of, we get a couple 150s and stuff, and it's. I mean, I think that's a, it's a weird thing because if you look at how much time we put in to the farms we have here, or even in Kansas, you know, or. Like we come across big deer, but like I could find, oh, I had, I had a 170 on the mountain here last year. I may not have had a deer in Iowa or Illinois on a camera that was bigger than that deer. Mm -hmm. And like when you get to what we're talking about here, which is, you know, even when Chris is talking about that 200 incher, like you're married to a certain deer that you're trying to kill. Like, sure. If another booner shows up, you're going to kill him. Yeah. But you're hunting a certain deer. And so that, that dramatically (laughs) limits the effort that you can put in across multiple states. Cause you're like, uh, yeah, I've got one fifties here in Ohio, but I've got a one seventy in Pennsylvania. That's the deer I'm hunting mm-hmm. period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really is on a, like a case by case basis. I mean, that's, that's why we spread such a, a broad net early mm-hmm. in the season is we're hoping to pick up a deer. Like, you know, Chris has got there in Iowa. Um, and when you find one, it's like, okay, we start to shift resources towards, whatever state it's in right it's like how do we make sure we have tags for this how do we you know make sure we can spend time down there getting food mm-hmm. plots and feeders in and stuff and 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 while you're doing that the idea is that these other places that you have access to as long as you have them for the foreseeable future you know they just continue to improve or well know. chris is supposed to come hunt with us this year Stu- if he tells Stu- me where he wants to go you know oh yeah tell me where to buy a tag at <laughs> i was hoping it was kansas it's not so we're out there ohio's probably uh, the ohio spot. probably yeah, we've got a, a real sweet lease. And just, dude, by chance, it worked yeah. out so perfectly that it's literally, like, almost connects to my farm, my family farm. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. Yeah, so it's... Just random. Just randomly. And they killed, they killed like, a, you know, pushing 200 out there last year. Yeah. And yeah. it's it, that was a freak. Like, I'm not saying that it's going to happen every year. It's but, pretty much 400 acres of, like, timber, which is rare in that part of the country. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've hunted it twice and those were both like in January for like a 140 inch eight. Mm-hmm. But, um, I think that like October, I think it's good rut farm. Yeah. Real good rut farm. So that's probably where we'll have. Yeah. Plus we got places to stay. That'd be yeah. fun. Yeah. But yeah, I but mean, we don't know. We, we haven't run cameras. Yeah, we on don't it. know what's on it. We haven't had a hunting season on it yet. So we don't know. Yeah. Well, food plots and everything, but yeah, we don't know. We know there's a crackhead living dead center on it though. <laughs> Like literally, the landowner's son is like staying in his like hunting shack, mm-hmm. and, oh, and no. it was the landowner that told me he's like, yeah, he's crackhead. He's just I don't. I'm just, <laughs> I was like, do we need to worry about our cameras and stuff? He's like, yeah. I'm thinking, might catch him at three a.m. walking around naked in the woods. Or yeah, something. I was thinking he's about just catch flip, a rage in the cage, flipping him a <laughs> dream season, baby. Yeah. <laughs> slip That's him funny. a one hundred and a greyhound ticket, uh, and be like, hey, uh, time to time to head out to pasture here. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it, it is cause we do have a lot of different properties. And again, we talk about cell cameras. I mean, we've got a ton of cameras out, you know, we've got them in Kentucky and Illinois and Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania, Kansas. Um, as of right now, we probably have what, 10 active at this moment, 10 active cameras, 15, including my property. Yeah. But, um, but by the end, yeah, we'll have 30 or 30. <laughs> That's why I said, but Chris was like, Hey, I think we're getting some cameras on shore. I'm like, yeah, just 
slide 30 across for me. Dude, if you guys could figure out how to do like a loan program, <laughs> I'm dead serious. If you could figure out how to do a loan program for cell cam data, like you would own a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, um, it's one of those things, I guess, to your point, Jared, about spreading ourselves out. Like if, if somebody made a comment on one of the podcasts the other day, they're like, man, you're still like, reading those things. Yeah. I read them every day. They're like, man, you guys are like, you got land all over the place. Like you guys, all you must do is like hunt. And it's like, no, I wish like, that's what I did, but it's not. And it's like, they don't understand. <laughs> I can't like, actually remember the last time I was like, well, I just, we, we need opportunity. Right. And I mean, Chris, yeah. that's what we talked about when we're having you come out and hunt. It's like, you're just looking for opportunity outside of Iowa, you know, which sounds crazy, but at the same time, it's like, you know, you can only hunt so much and put so much pressure on a certain area. You know, and so even if you do have that one buck, whether it's that 200 inch or a different deal, like you can only put so much pressure in that area before you're like, damn it, like I can't, yeah. I, I probably need to give it a breather, you know, or at least back off or he's not there. Like if he's not there, why the hell am I going to sit there and hunt for two weeks? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. When I have too, man, I, dude, I, this deer on the mountain I hunted multiple times. I'm like, I just feel like I'm hunting a ghost, you know, and it's like, I haven't seen him. Nobody's told me that he's dead. Like, I guess I'm going to keep hunting, but it's like, for all I know, he is dead somewhere laying in a ditch. I don't, you know, or somebody poached him. Who knows anymore? But then he shows up and he you're could, like, we don't know at this point. He could, dude, that deer could be a giant this year. That deer would be 180s this year if he shows up. Usually in the next three to four weeks. Yeah. On the same mineral lick every year. I'm getting anxious. I've, yeah, I've been watching. I'm super anxious. I'm twitching at this mm -hmm. point. Nobody that I know has killed him. So he's either that or he's just rut dead somewhere, yeah. which is does happen. Yeah. Does happen. But yeah, I mean, it. Before we know it, it's pretty crazy how quick the next three months go by. Yeah. Yeah. It's also crazy. It's crazy how bad not hunting season sucks. Like, yeah. Like, like dude, in J February and March, other than shed hunting, which is which is fun. I'm just like, dude, this is terrible. Like, how? Do, like, just just let's fast forward to hunting season. But dude, it goes so fast too. Like that's where we talk. And about it's that weight that makes hunting season so special. Yeah. So I'm not complaining. I'm but it, like, if we talk about like hunting at conservative, like you were saying, Chris, like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be conservative. That's normally how I start my season on a deer. And at some point, maybe I can get my ass in gear and change that mindset. But like, I'm. Always like, yeah, I'm not going to press in now. In fact, a couple of years here in Pennsylvania, I didn't even hunt till the end of October because I'm just like, yeah, it's not worth it. Like, I don't want to put the pressure on it until it's worth it. But then next thing you know, you literally wake up and it's Halloween. And you're like, shit, half the season is gone. Like, it's already done. It's not me anymore, dude. I'm. I, I think like your chances at a, a high, like a high odd situation they come so rarely. Mm -hmm that um you, you need several of those to stack up to, to kill a deer mm -hmm. so i've just been getting probably overly aggressive but at the same time i've been actively expanding my range to say i've got more places to hunt mm -hmm. now so that if i if i really do blow this deer out of here and like which i i think deer will tolerate a lot more pressure than most people think probably um but if i if that does happen i'll just i'll move somewhere else i'll try a different spot so how are you and alex gonna divvy up the hunting pressure because you got 50 acres right i mean and i'm sure you've got several spots on that 50 acres that you guys could hunt at the same time and not necessarily affect each other but yeah, so we'll have to, so like we've got that 100 acres there and then there's basically another farm that i lease that is catty corner to it mm -hmm. that is 80 acres so we've actually got 180 acres oh, yeah. right there oh, yeah. um and she just because of her job right now she doesn't have as much time as i do you know like <clears throat> a little bit more flexible i can you know leave the office at four o'clock and go jump in a box blind and mm -hmm. sit there and four o'clock we'll make sure we emphasize that work on my laptop in a box blind or yeah. you know i can take off a, a week during the rut and she's pretty cool about it because you know she understands how passionate i am about it and she's she obviously loves to hunt too mm -hmm. but, um she uh She's like, no, you need to go be in a tree. If we can't find anybody to watch the the girls, then she's yeah. like, just, I know you'll go nuts if you're not out there. Usually we can find someone, but, you know, typically she'll go early muzzleloader. And That's what I was going to say. Really that. She's yep. the last four year, four seasons, she's shot a nice buck during early muzzleloader. Um, and that's a nine day season. That's like third week of October, second, second to third week of October in Iowa. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to focus on, you know, going with her and filming, filming that hunt. And then 
kind of gets the pressure off, you know, like she kills a deer and then it's like, well, I, I killed one. So Chris now go bow hunt and do whatever you want to do. Um, that's how I feel. Now I got two what daughters and they're both, they've already named their food plots and like, where's my box? <laughs> do that? And uh-uh. you know, we took them there two nights ago and I was out spraying where I'm going to end up putting a fall brassica plot in. And then Alex brought them out and they've got one, area that they named ireland's alley and then the other spot is alice's alley and then they got an argument that well you can't hunt my spot and so right now right now i think i have probably more time to all have more i guess i'll be in the driver's seat more right now than i will be yeah. in five years yeah then it's gonna be I, I i want that you know i feel like there's a there's a lot of really serious hunters out there that i see that have kids that don't hunt that much and i and i'm not saying this happens a lot of the time, but I can see where we get so possessed and so driven to go out there and fill our own tags that we're not sacrificing, sure. not being the hunter. And we're not bringing some of these kids up to start hunting mm-hmm. and we're maybe too serious on them. And maybe we're too, you know, you can't shoot that deer, but you can shoot that deer. I can tell For you right sure. now, I don't care. I don't care what they shoot. But then like two days ago, I'm like, well, what happens if I go, what, what buck do you want to shoot? They're like, Ireland's like, well, I want to shoot a big one. I go, how big? She's like, it's got to be about like this or bigger. <laughs> I go, well, this deer walks out. She's like, no, I don't want to shoot a little deer. And, you know, it's like, where did this come from? You yeah. know, they just raise a certain way. And that might change when she gets behind. Yeah, the in the heat of the She's moment. Like, Isn't that weird? Quick. Um, but it's funny, like the thought process, because when I was a kid and I started hunting, dude, it was like, I mean, you guys know what it was like. Yeah. But I lived down here where you could literally hunt wherever you wanted no one cared. You could knock on any door and they'd say, go shoot whatever deer you see. And there was no, there was no blinds. There wasn't even pop-up blinds back mm-hmm. then when I started hunting. That was like right when they first came out, but I'd shoot whatever deer I know. came by. There was no such thing as management or food plots or whatever, you know, yeah. times have changed a lot, Yeah. but sorry to get on a little rant there. I don't know. We'll figure it out. I'll probably take the, I'll probably let her pick where she wants to go and then I'll follow suit or one of us will just film each other. That, that perception that like a kid has about what kind of deer they want to hunt and stuff is just is really interesting mm-hmm. to to me because you I, had some of that. I mean, because I would say that you know you didn't shoot the first four corn that walked by you. Yeah, like, and I'm not better than anybody because I did mm-hmm. it this way. Just for whatever reason, I f- I felt like like I just right away wanted to shoot a big deer, and I was willing mm-hmm. to let bucks for what i don't know why mm-hmm. exactly and, and i may shot the first buck i i've only ever shot a handful of bucks maybe 10 mm-hmm. less than 10 mm-hmm. and i've let you know way more than that walk and i've missed some too mm-hmm. that I, i'm not proud of but mm-hmm. um the first buck i ever shot was a a two-year-old with my bow mm-hmm. and i rattled him in and i mean it was it was awesome and i i was like man that's a decent rack yep. buck and um recovered him and i was like cool Ne- what's next i'm looking for a bigger buck mm-hmm. so on my farm i shot a 130 inch three-year-old when i was like i don't know 14 15 mm-hmm. some, something like that and at the it's time was, ohio, then? ohio yep that's yeah. on my farm and i was like dude biggest buck i've i've shot you know and then from from there i'm like okay it's gotta it's gotta get bigger mm-hmm. and i went pretty quickly so it wasn't like hey i shot a dozen of them that were two-year-olds mm-hmm. and then i shot five of them that were three-year-olds and i, I slowly grew it was like each one almost right market. away i was like yeah. i i'm i'm looking for one 150 plus and, and over time that evolved into an age class and also understanding um um the ability of different areas to produce different sure. types of deer but some people just aren't that way i know six-year-olds that are more than happy to shoot a two-year-old every year and i'm just yeah it's it's just different i mean you know i know i gr- when i grew up i mean first year i killed was a button buck and then i shot a spike and then i shot like an eight point and like i just you know i shot a bunch of one and two year old bucks growing up i mean it wasn't until i think i moved to missouri that i probably shot my first three-year-old or older deer um you know and that was just because i didn't see i, th- I think mine was my uncle i think my uncle yeah. just because he was he was you know an experienced bow hunter and he was intentionally trying to shoot big bucks mm-hmm. And so I think for that reason, and because he got me into bow hunting, I was like, I, I want to shoot big bucks. I'll see that in my kids now. Like obviously, so Carter shot his first, um, buck with a gun last year, four point out of a muddy bull box line. And like, he was excited. 
I can see him wanting to shoot a bigger buck this year. Mm -hmm. Harlan, on the other hand, who shot a doe, first deer he sees next year, he's shooting. Second deer he sees, he's shooting. Like he'll just kill her. He's just mowing them. Yeah. You know, and at some point I'll see him want to kill bigger deer. Like I showed him this morning when we woke up and we had that buck down at the cabin. I'm like, hey, this this is going to be a, a good one this year. You know, and Harlan doesn't care. Like if there was a spike behind him, he'd shoot that deer. Doesn't. Mm. But, uh, you know, you just don't know until you get them out there. And I, I don't care. Like, this year, like, if uh, Spike walks out and Carter's like, hey, I want to shoot it, like, cool, dude, shoot it. Like, shoot as many bucks as you want. Like, I don't care. Whatever makes you happy and enjoy hunting. Yeah. Um, But you're going to have that. Like, uh, I knew a guy, really good hunter, growing up, and I was killing a lot of bucks. I was killing a lot of deer in Pennsylvania. And it was like, he was probably... At that time, he was probably in his mid-30s, maybe. And, like, we hunted a lot together, and he was just super picky. Like, we, mm. he would pass bucks, and I'm like, Joe, like, what are you doing, man? Like, that's a – like, it was like a two-year-old eight-point. But in Pennsylvania, like, we were killing those deer. Mm -hmm. And, like, at one point he shot, like, I don't know, it was like a 110-inch eight-point or something with his gun. And then somebody was like, yeah, that's Joe's first buck. I'm like, What? I was like, no. I was like, I've watched him pass like 20 deer as we've hunted. And he's crazy? like, no. He's like, that's yeah. his first buck. He just didn't want to shoot any of those other ones. Yeah. And it's just crazy how you meet some, me. Like, and I know my grandpa was that way. First three point that walked out in front of him was getting shot. Like, he didn't care. Yeah. You know, it just, that's well, what he wanted th to that, shoot. That's a hard, like, statistic to show people. It's easy to look at your wall and say, well, look at these bucks I've killed. Mm -hmm. What you can't do other than you know, phone videos or whatever says, look at all these bucks I've passed, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes that track record, record is almost more impressive. Where do you think you're at in that kind of stage, Chris? Cause obviously you're in Iowa, you know, we look behind you, there's a ton of big bucks there. Like, are, you know, are you looking for a combination of age and antler size? Are there certain bucks that you've just built history with where it's like, I don't really care what he looks like. I just know who it is. And I want to, that's who I'm going to try to shoot this year. Are you always setting a tag aside for like that true trophy? Like what, what's the your one. mindset going in this year? So it, it used to be where I just wanted to kill something. doesn't yep. matter how big. And then it got to the point where like, if it was a one thirty to or bigger, I'd want to kill it. Yep. And, and now it's to the point where I just want to shoot something that's five or older. Yep. And uh, like you know, last year, late muzzleloader, I had uh, one farm that there was this stud, well, I think he was, I'm, we're pretty sure he was four, but he was probably low 160s. I posted a picture of him on my Facebook from the blind. Um, and he was, like I said, low 160s, really nice, clean 10. And I knew there was a deer that was probably six or seven that going back to just not a big rack. I mean, mm -hmm. he had one spike on one side that had like a little drop time. And then his other side was just a five point side that if he had both, it would have been maybe 140, maybe. Um, and that was the deer I targeted and that's the deer I shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that we all go through certain stages and that's why I won't ever, you know, judge someone who decides to shoot sure. a certain deer. The only time I get upset about that is when a neighbor or someone tells you they won't kill a deer and then, and they, then do. they do. That uh -huh. pisses me off when, when you're talking with neighbors and you're like, Hey, this buck showed up, we're all on the same page. And that's, that's happened. That's mm -hmm. happened before. And you know, like it was, I had to match that off this buck from two years ago and last year you know one of the neighbors was sending me trail camera photos of him and I was getting photos of him and he was saying man I think this deer's four let's not shoot it I'm like okay that's cool. fine we're not going to shoot it I go I think he might be five but I go if you guys are on board with that then we'll be on board with that mm -hmm. third week of October fourth week of late October it's like I see this picture on Facebook I'm like are you kidding me? That was, that was the deer you guys said you weren't going to kill. And I gave them the match set. And the guy who killed it was like, dude, I, he doesn't, you know, they hunt some of the same land. He's like, he doesn't speak for me. I, I wanted to kill this deer. I killed it. Cause I wasn't giving him shit. I'm much yeah. like, Hey, this is, this is that buck that yeah. so said you guys were going to pass. And then they shot him. But wow. no, I guess I'm to the point now where I don't even, I don't even care as much about fill on a tag. Um, and it, it was, I think it's really good timing for us to buy this property because I want to just see wildlife thrive, you know, like sure. there's a lot of habitat work we've been doing and, you know, we've enrolled some, some, we've taken some of the cropland out, put it in CRP yep. and I want to just, 
I see pheasants every now and then I hear them. I see quail every now and then, oh, that's but cool. not very often. So I, I just want to see wildlife thrive. And then I want to target certain deer unless some, you know, one might pass through that I decide to put a tag on, but I think part of the, part of the fun is just like building up your habitat and your farm and then seeing these deer year after year after mm-hmm. year, getting to know them, getting to know their habits. That, that to me is almost more fun than actually filling a tag. Yeah, well, and for, for the sure. girls too, man, like uh, one thing that I've, I've kind of done, like last year I hunted pencil, even though I had the biggest buck I've ever seen in Pennsylvania on camera, I hunted a handful of times, maybe, you know, almost all of my Pennsylvania hunting season was dedicated to one of the boys or both of the boys, you know, and they're five and nine. And, um, you know, what I, what I love about it is like, uh, you know, I've got 30 acres behind the house. Um, we've got 80 acres in Kentucky. I don't even hunt there. Like I, I'll prep it. I'll plant food plots. I'll put box blinds up. I'll put stands up. I don't even hunt it. It's uh, my wife can hunt it and it's for the boys to hunt. And like, I'll run cameras and I have just as much excitement. Like the other day I got a picture on one of the muddy cell cams of like five, one-year-old bucks at like our mineral lick. And like, in most cases it'd be like, eh, who cares? But like, I was excited because I'm like, all right, there will be bucks here for those boys to have a shot at at some point right behind the house. Um, and you'll find that like in, and to your point earlier, like I take my hunting very serious, but like when they want to hunt and they have an interest in hunting, like I don't even pick up a weapon. Like it's just not even in the playbook. It's all effort. Blinds are set. Stands are set. Cameras are set simply to get them to kill something. I don't care about anything else. Yeah. Um, and so I think the girls with you having that property, the girls will love that. Obviously they're already naming their own spots and food plots and stuff like the fact that they have something to build their entire career on. And we, we took a little bit of shit, I think from our last podcast, going back to me reading the YouTube comments, um, and that like, we definitely, even growing up, we both had a lot of private access. Mm-hmm. I hunted public, but we had a lot of private access and that's just how we were growing up. And people are like, oh, you know, you guys don't understand how lucky you are to have that. And it's like, listen, man, I mean, to each their own. Oh, I do. You know? Yeah, I do. And and just... And, and we were. I, I was definitely privileged to sure. have this farm to hunt. But in, the reality is that didn't happen until I was... How old am I now? It didn't happen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> how yeah, old dude, are you? That didn't happen until, like, I was in co- like college. Yeah. Because before that, all of it was leased. Leased. Yeah, my, my family owned it, but... It was a cattle operation, and mm-hmm. they were leasing it to hunters. Like, I didn't really have a say in it. Mm-hmm. And so, well, yeah, we had all this ground. I couldn't hunt it until I was, like, in college. And mm-hmm. then we had to, you know, make up for the fact that it had been a cattle farm for so long. But, dude, prior to that, we only hunted permission in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. That, that's all I had. And that's where I get a little bit, um, you know, like, I, one guy was saying, like, he quit hunting or something about it. And I'm like, man, like, from a kid's standpoint— like I'll do whatever it takes, whether it's my kids or somebody else to like, just get them hooked. Like it only has to be one time to get them hooked, but like, yeah, it's tough to go out there and get on public land, but it's, I don't know. I've hunted public land across a lot of different States and a little effort from a parent to get their kid involved will go a long way. I mean, you can, you can get on deer and most of these places on public land. Well, and to to the point about access, like the, the harsh reality is that there is not enough opportunity for everyone. No. I would love for there to be. I would love for everybody that wants to to be able to go out to their own track of land and, and shoot a five- or six-year-old buck. That would mm-hmm. be amazing. It's not possible. The no. resource doesn't exist. And so I'm all for regulation or barriers to entry that make it more difficult because I know that I'm personally willing, and I know that you guys probably are too, to, to put in that extra effort to, to make more money so that I'm mm-hmm. able to, to do these things you know, it gives me a goal to, to strive for. Um, and if that, if we lose some hunters along the way, um, yeah. you know, cause they're not willing to put that in it goes again, back it to, sucks, but that's just what it is. It goes back to leases. I mean, Chris, what you don't have to tell us specifically, but what on average are you guys paying for a lease out there? You know, it used to be where eight to $10 an acre was hmm. pretty common. I would say with pretty fair value. And now you're looking, I mean, if you can get a lease for 15 an acre, I'd say that's, yeah, uh, still pretty actually, damn good. Uh, Dude, what, was, are, uh, what are they sitting in Ohio? Farm. 35 an acre? Mm-hmm. Ohio's 35 an acre. Yeah. Yeah. There was actually a, a 200, 200 acre farm that was, I just saw on that national hunting lease network. Yeah. Um, 
and that one was uh, sixty one hundred dollars for the two hundred. Yeah, I think it's and it's, that's a bid price too. That'll get bidded up higher, I think, on that. that that's literally in, like right down the road from me. Oof. So the higher prices are definitely. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And what do you do, man? I mean, it, it, somebody was complaining about that too. It's like, what are, what's my option? Like if I don't lease it, somebody else is. Well, and it's not like we're all going to go on strike and say, yeah, we're yeah. not going to lease any more ground. Well, I used, it's, it's a, it's a battle you won't win. I used to be completely against leasing here. You yeah. know, I was the kid that grew up in Southern Iowa that could hunt wherever I wanted. And I got pretty bitter about it because I was like losing ground left and right. Yeah. I'll be a buck got shot. And as soon as that buck got shot, non-residents just flooded here and started buying up ground mm -hmm. which looking back i mean man it was crazy the prices that they were buying that ground for 20 years ago i know but then the leases started coming and i was super bitter about it like when i was in college like i still remember like getting on iowawhitetail.com which was a forum oh yeah like there's no excuses to lease ground go knock on doors i can still do this and then then boom i lost one of my best farms because someone leased it and I was sitting there going, you know what, this is a battle I cannot win. So I can either sit here and just complain about it mm -hmm. or I can just do something about it and get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing about it, it's like hunting is ever changing. And obviously it depends on where you're at to where you're at in that point. But, you know, you go to some Southern States and it's like, you're in a hunt club and you're drawing a straw to see what stand you're going to see. Yes. In. So it's, mm -hmm it's definitely an interesting topic. Um, I hate, you know, some part of me hates the fact that we're to this point here, mm -hmm. but then again, how do you blame a landowner who doesn't hunt and they've got these expenses, they've got, they've got things that they've got to pay for and, you know, they want to maximize their profit off their land. So how yep. can you blame anybody for that? No, you can't, man. And I mean, the thing is, is if you look at it, like back in the day when it was kind of wide open pressure, from hunters was under control, right? There was still just a set amount of people who were hunting those areas. The moment that things start to happen per the Albia buck or a flood of things happens, like something has to put that back in check because if you leave it wide open and that increased pressure comes, the resource that we know as Iowa big bucks is gone, right? You're never gonna have them anymore because people are gonna shoot every three-year-old that walks by them. And so I think that that natural evolution in hunting is now leases and lease pricing going up because that will regulate the pressure because it's regulating the access, which is then allowing certain deer to get to better ages and stuff like that. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's working its way out. Do we like where it's going? No. I mean, nobody wants to pay 30 acres to be able to have, uh, you know, or $30 an acre to have 80 acres to hunt for the year. But if you don't do that and you leave the resource wide open, you're also going to never kill a buck over 130 inches again because they're all going to get killed at three years old. That is the the key is, is management of that resource. I mean, I, I look at it on the micro scale, like my farm, I'm always getting after my dad for wanting to bring people out to hunt. It's like, dude, this farm is not as good as you think it is. Mm -hmm. Like I'm all for getting people opportunities as well. But when you get six, seven, eight guys mm -hmm. trying to have the same experience, like it goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, the same applies to a statewide basis. Yep. You know, you got to, you got to protect it to, well, to keep it good. And that's why I, like, I look at what you guys have in Iowa, Chris, from a non-resident standpoint. And eventually I think that you're probably resident buck allocations and stuff will change slightly. You know how, I, I don't know, but Kansas is going to naturally evolve to Iowa, right? Like instantly from the results that we saw, I can say that probably in the next two years, you will need to have one preference point in order to draw in Iowa. It will not be possible to draw with zero or I'm sorry, in Kansas. Um, it won't be possible to draw a zero. Eventually it'll be, you need two preference points to draw in Kansas and it's going to naturally evolve to, at some point it'll be three or four in most of the good areas to draw in Kansas. That may be 15 years from now, but the, the reason for it is if you change that, if you bump the allocation, then you're going to change the resource, which is big bucks in Kansas are because there's less hunters and there's more area and thus they get older. It's genes too, and it's feed as well, but it's because of the pressure. And if you don't put that in check, then eventually nobody wants to go and hunt Kansas because it's I can kill those same deer in Ohio or Pennsylvania and you know, for over the counter. Like Chris said too, it's hard to turn that money away once it starts coming in. Like it, it'd be easy for me as somebody who wants to see big deer thrive, say, Well, just cut your firearm licenses in half. Well, and that's easy. where like Illinois will be interesting but because how Illinois much money is that Illinois has historically produced really good deer. And it's all over the counter. Yep. 
you know, will they at some point, at least for non-residents, start to do allocation? My my thinking is based on the way pressure is going. Yeah, they're going to have to at least for firearms. I think it'll jump around too, though. Like there, there's only so many hunters, you know, and apparently it's on the decline. There are states that still don't get the the pressure probably that is warranted by the mm-hmm. deer that are there. And I don't necessarily want Kansas sh- is one of them, shine a flashlight on any of. Well, Kansas is one of those ones that people have figured out and are starting to and, and are flocking there. Damn but, it, crispy. Well, whatever. <laughs> Us too. We talk about it on the podcast, but. Um, you know, eventually, yeah, eventually that, that pressure will fluctuate from state to state. Like you've still got states, dude, Kentucky is a sleeper. Tennessee is a sleeper. Yeah. Oklahoma is a sleeper. Well, we talked about Mississippi Wisconsin, Delta and stuff. Wisconsin is one of those ones that probably whatever, 10, 15 years ago was slamming. People were like, dude, that's where the bucks are at. Yeah. But nowadays it's kind of overlooked. And so mm-hmm. I think there's, a, there's gotta be a pattern to where. When did Iowa make that change, Chris? When do you think that, that. Balancing Tennessee is a sleeper. Tilted. Throw that one in there too. Yeah. Like when when did Iowa tilt to all of a sudden it was like, you know, hey, like you have to build lots of points here to come hunt because this is where you want to be. Really started in early two thousands. Early two thousands. Yep. That's when it started where it was like every other year. Mm-hmm. In the nineties, in the early nineties. I mean, it was every year. Well, dude, and, and that then, that one it makes perfect sense that, that one evolved into this the fastest because you've got the Drury's, the Lakoskis, Midwest Whitetail, everybody is in Iowa. Mm-hmm. And it's a huge hub in Southern Iowa, guys that are, you know, producing content yep. and showing the world that content. Yep. And, and then kudos to Iowa DNR for not caving to open up more non-resident tags yeah. because they could have, and it still may only take, Jared and I could be hunting it this year with three points. If they would have opened they, up more they allocation. Could, they could triple, I mean, they could literally go from 6,000 to, 20,000 mm-hmm. and triple their income in a year. I would gladly pay double for my resident tag. Mm-hmm. Can you pull up those same stats in Iowa? I wonder if I, it wouldn't surprise I me. I bet it's going down. And I mean, let's, let's just say Iowa does need money. Most state agencies do. It wouldn't surprise me if they looked at a way to say, okay, Hey, non res or Iowa residents we're uh, we're cutting a tag. It's a one buck state, but in exchange, we're going to double the number of non-resident tags. Or just charge more. For money. Dude, I'd rather wait two or three years and pay two or three times as much. Yeah. I mean, it is. Uh, unfortunately, as much as we all want to talk about the deer resource and the wildlife resource, it's economic. Right? I mean... Do you guys know who, uh, do you guys know who um, Jonathan Moreland is? Mm-mm. I don't think so. He, he's from uh, Arkansas, so he killed... He, Anyways, he killed this like monster with his recurve down in Arkansas this year, mm-hmm. but I've known him for quite a while. And I always told him like, you draw a bow tag, then, um, you know, like I can help you out with some places to hunt or whatever. So he drew his Iowa tag last year and he, he, um, he bow hunted with me and he was at my house and he was telling me, he's like, and anyways, he killed this like 185 in Arkansas. It is a state record. For a tradition, so wow. Look him up on Facebook. He's Crazy. Let's pull that up. Uh, what was his name? Jonathan Moreland. Jonathan Moreland. Pull that up real quick. Um, so he was telling me, he's like, yeah, just to get back to where I hunt at, he's in a hunt club. He has to drive a side by side, like 20 minutes down this level B road. And he goes, it gets so darn muddy. We get stuck. We have winches. We have to pull these things through. And I'm like, F that man, like the stuff that you're dealing with mm-hmm. down there to, to, to have a Moreland. place to hunt is like crazy. Buck in Arkansas. Well, I want to see a he picture. He came here to Iowa and he, you know, like okay. I said, he waited five years, never bow hunted the state before. Mm-hmm. And he, he didn't kill a deer when he was here. He hunted for seven days. Then he came back like a week later and hunted for like four days. Oh. He never killed one. But he, when he left, he's like, dude, I'm not lying. This was the best hunting experience of my entire life. Like the, the age structure, the quality of the herd. He's like, I hope you guys never change the rules. He goes, I'll wait six years or seven years to come back and experience this again. Wow. You weren't running into other people left and right. I mean, even on public land, you're not, you're not going to. It is. It's throttled, man. That's awesome. Yeah. We're looking at this picture now. That's, yeah, that's a giant. Yeah. That's a tank. He's got a YouTube channel too. And I think he's going to post that, that video at some point. Um, the summer okay but the dude's the dude is insane like i think he's legally might be insane and his reaction after he shoots that deer was he was showing me the video i was i was dying laughing it was like it was like wwf when they come running out of the back <laughs> and stuff i mean it was it was it looks funny, like but. straight ultimate warrior coming out 
Um, mm, that it, and it is crazy, man. I mean, uh, again, not to like throttle different states and stuff, but I mean, again, I think Iowa and Iowa could have some room to make some changes, whether they reduce the residents and double the amount of non-resident tags or whatever. But Kansas is going to naturally evolve into that, right? It's it's on that pathway. This year was the marker. You know, now it's like, okay, we pretty much need a preference point to hunt Kansas. Could we get drawn every year? Potentially, but likely not. Um, what will Illinois do, right? Will they change that to where uh, non-residents do have to draw instead of it being over the counter? It's hard to turn away from that money, but what's the resource, um, you know, availability? Missouri's still over the counter, and it's a three-buck state, basically. Yeah. Dude, just, yeah, you just got to get creative, man. That's that's. What- it's one of the reasons we started mule deer hunting was like, mm-hmm. uh, there's lots of reasons, but you can have fun hunting anything anywhere. You just mm-hmm. have to just be realistic about like what an area can produce. And well, that's why I asked like Chris make, make an adventure out of it where his like stand. Cause like this year I'm like, there are certain bucks I want to see that I will probably spend most of my time hunting. But like at the end of it, like I'm still looking, it depends on the state. Like in most states, I'm still looking for a four and older. Yeah, dude. You know, that's, that's what I'm looking to kill. Yep. You know, it is. Yeah, obviously, I'd love to go to Iowa and kill a six year old 185 yes. incher, but on my farm in Ohio, if I can kill a 150 four year old, I'll be Done. ecstatic. Mm-hmm. I'll be ecstatic. Yeah. And I mean, you just so have to manage expectations. I, do you guys see this? And um, now we're on the subject of public and private. It, I've almost seen like the last couple of years, I've almost seen like a negative connotation put on guys private. that are hunting private farms and killing big deer like, 100%, well, they're it's killing stupid. that big deer because it's private and they got that box one they've got that food pot it's a, and it's dude like, it's the same tone of voice where guys are like oh well you killed that with a with a gun so it's not as not as admirable yeah, I, yeah. We, we gotta quit doing that we just we're all oh it's terrible dude not quit the whole well he killed that with that gun or he killed that on that private manicured farm or whatever else i mean everybody you know, like I see like when the, like for instance, like Mark Jury, yep. when he kills a giant, if you read the comments, it's like people just bat, I mean, half of them are people are like, oh, well, it must be nice to kill a farm, a pen raised deer. I know. know it's crazy. You know, man. It's like, dude, Mark lives literally 30 minutes from me. And I have, I talk to him quite often. And I mean, I've never seen someone so obsessed with a deer, with whitetails. The yeah. dude is obsessed mm-hmm. and he thinks about it 24 seven. And he wasn't just gifted thousand yeah. acres of private land to hunt he wasn't gifted that he worked his ass off to get to that point mm-hmm. where he could do what he's doing now mm-hmm. yeah and people seem to forget that you know oh, they mean? do man and yeah. and then they look at it and and again just like jared and i are doing with hunter right now it's like we're gonna go and lease up ground to give us opportunities you can't kill big bucks without opportunities like there is yeah. a huge amount of luck that's still oh, even involved. if we have it we're probably still not gonna kill big bucks there. Yeah, like, i it mean just... it's 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 just not possible but the yeah you see this so much it's like and don't get me wrong like if somebody goes out and kills a 150 inch three year old buck on Ohio or Pennsylvania public land, yeah, man, that's a huge accomplishment. Like, kudos to you. That's freaking awesome. But don't turn around and badmouth me because I'm trying to kill a 170 inch six year old on Pennsylvania private ground. And yeah, it's a thousand acres, but it's like, you know, just because you don't, you think that it's so easy because you're out there, you know, trudging public land don't badmouth me about it i have put a hell of a lot of time to get that deer even to that point and, and there and then you know the whole public land thing i mean there's a big difference between public land in iowa versus public land in yes. pennsylvania you yep. know like i can drive by public land parking lots here and not see anybody besides prime rut yeah yeah it's a different world i mean it really is and uh yeah. so the whole the whole like i guess just negative connotation about well, that guy's on private or you know like i it's funny now i've got a buddy where we see we see guys that are around here that you know kill some deer on on public land and they do a great job and they you know they work hard to kill those deer on public land but it's almost like it's almost like that's put on a pedestal when we have private land that's right next to public yes and those deer don't know the boundary they don't know and there's there's some some of the private farms around here have more have more pressure on them than some of the public land some of these guys are hunting. Yeah. yeah. So, dude, I, I Chris. don't know. I just, I, we got to make sure, we got to try to do our best to quit being so darn judgmental. Mm-hmm. Sa- same situation where I hunt in Kansas. It's literally like, uh, you look on a map, it's like kind of an X marks the spot as far as property lines. I've got refuge that's not able to be hunted um, t- to one side of me. I've got pri- 
I can I could shoot if I wanted to. I could shoot over the fence like 40, 50 yards into this refuge or into private, which is directly there. And I'm in the far, you know, back butt crack of of public, and I access it with mm-hmm. on a river. System. I mean, the buck I killed. In yeah, Kansas. those deer don't know. They're they're on non huntable ground, private ground that's not huntable and and public, which is yeah. it's just like a buck I killed. In if Kansas I'm over there, I'm a better was, hunter. Was well. public, and you know, but we had that deer Worst on. One? The buck I killed last year it was on public. Which one did you kill last year? That 157, 10 point down on oh, the yeah. flat. In Kansas, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, but we had that deer. All over private. All over private. I just set up on public in yeah, between our leases. That is funny. I wasn't even on our leases. I just sat, and I didn't even need to access. I literally accessed as you would to hunt public and killed did that you, deer. Did you use a kayak? No, not that year. Does, Jared does did. Count. Does not yeah, count. Did, Jared, public. yeah, it doesn't count if he's, you got to use, you had the perfect one. You just skipped it off. I had back. two people on a kayak. We had a two man. Yeah. Oh, nice. His his would count if he killed it on public. Then yours doesn't the, count. the difference yeah. is, yeah, he killed his. I skipped one off the back mm-hmm. at twenty yards. And I also had somebody drive through a cattle pasture to come pick it up, which doesn't count. So I have to I have to process it in the field and backpack it. Yeah, out but he's a landowner, so you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's a resident. Yeah. It is. That's a that's a funny that's a funny point. How I could kill him here on his private. I have access to, and that's not as admirable as I kill the same deer fifty yards over here 100%. on public, and they're like, nice, good job. I mean, yeah. we, we shed hunted, uh, well, one's not here. So pretty boys is, is getting fixed. Found him on public. Do you know of, uh, antlers by Klaus? You heard of him? He's like a ta- yeah, tax he terms. We found him. We found a big, how big is that shed? Like 82 inches. Mm-hmm. Found a big side off the buck that I missed the year prior. Mm-hmm. And he had just gotten chewed up a little bit. And so I sent him in to get, this fixed is the out. other one we found 50 yards from that on the public, on the private side of fence. So like same side, they're both like 82 inch sheds. Yeah. And so, I mean, these two deer shed wise were 50 yards apart, one on public, one on private. But well, what I'm saying is like people would be like, oh, that's cool. You found this on private. But then in the same breath, they'd be like, oh, you found that 80 inch set on public. And it's like, yeah, they were 50 yeah, yards apart. Yeah, they're like so much more impressed. They're like, it's 50 yards apart though. Yeah, it's funny no, how it works. Hundred percent. I, I said that to somebody the other day. In fact, these element guys I'm talking to, yeah. later, like, you found that on public? But when I told them I found this one on private, they're like, yeah, they're out there. <laughs> 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 Makes sense. It just doesn't, it, and it is, it's a, it's a really weird, weird connotation. And I don't think like, obviously, so we had Warb on here not too long ago. And I know those guys take shit. Like, it, obviously you're following them through the week, right? And it's all public, public, plug. And then they'll throw a private hunt in there from Pruka or whoever, right? And people are just like, uh, hunt private land. Want. Yeah, they're so unimpressed. Yeah, they are. They just throw shit at them for it. They're like, oh, okay. Or I watched on one where they access public via private. Like they knocked on a door and said, hey, can we walk through here? And people were like, oh, yeah, way to cheat. Like, what? I, I, it's crazy. It is crazy. What do you mean, cheat? Dude, I, I almost feel bad for those hunting public guys because they've, um, they've tied themselves to... Uh, I mean... There's definitely big bucks on public. Like, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but like, I, I would say generally speaking, there's gonna be more opportunity on on some private land. That's a real general statement, but they no, they you're right. they've basically tied themselves to say like, well, I'm gonna be like a great fighter, and I'm gonna fight with one hand behind my back forever. Yeah. Like, you've tied yourself to that. Well, they're gonna be the kings of two year olds, and I don't think that they're shy about that. I mean, yeah. if, if they see a two year old buck, they're killing it. Sure. Uh, unless it's in Iowa, of which, but I mean, dude, even talking to Warb and hearing about his Missouri farm, like that dude has a like heartstrings for that Missouri yeah. farm, and I feel like he can't show anything about it. Yeah, because he'll get tore up because it's his private farm, yeah. the farm he grew up on hunting, and it's like, dude, like that's you have a big emotional tie now that you have stepkids that live right there. Like you should be filming out hunting on that place, and I feel like the audience is gonna eat him up for it. Yeah, they will. They're not. They're, look, they're not looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it is. It's a weird. You know, here's the thing about public land in Iowa, though. I I would say that public land in Iowa is um. It is less pressured than most private places in some of the other states. Sure. Mm. Same in Kansas. Is Still, there? Very, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you, I mean, here's the thing about like, draw stats? The, where I'm at, um, and just like the last three weeks, you know, we've been out there multiple times a day doing you know getting the crp planted six weeks ago to plant getting ready to plant plots to mm-hmm. you know we're doing things to that's a year-round process this is Iowa. to have that one opportunity 
when then you look at public land and it's like those guys walk in a mile, they put a lot of work in, but they're, they're hunting some stuff too. That's less pressured than some of the private stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at your Iowa draw stats. So z- you're in zone five, Chris, is that where you're in? Yeah. So four, four points. And 560 is the quota. Yeah. And five, there's 1100, 178 applications. applicants. And most of those people are getting drawn after point number four. Four points and then an application. I'm yeah, so the fifth year. Yep. Does this happen to have uh, year-to-year statistics? And it, like, obviously, Jared, we could hunt uh, whatever zone three. That's what, gone. where's zone three? Is that southeast? I don't know. I'm not sure. Zone three is basically one preference point or two preference oh, that's points. Be northwest then. That's northwest. Be north yep. Zone one is very similar. There's like no applicants. Zone four seems like a three or four points and then draw. Zone four, I think south. I don't know. I don't know. Where Same with at. zone six, and then seven, eight, nine. Is that northeast? <laughs> ten. Only eighty-three people want to hunt in zone ten. Oh, there you go. Seven, eight, nine is is east and northeast. Five and six is your south and south central southwest. Yep. There you go. So five and six are five and six are the money ones, the right? Money. Mm-hmm. So it's a four and four and draw. So year five. Hmm. Yep. Which, what county are you in, Chris? What, can you Marion. get Monroe. back there? I, so I, I, I hunt in Monroe and Marion County. Northeast is nine. Is Bill now in, in nine. nine, northeast? Seven or nine. Yeah. He's somewhere up there. I don't know exactly where he's at. Could go hunt with Bill. That, that's some tough hunting up there. I mean, it's a lot of like, bluff country stuff. And I yep. mean, it's, that's tough hunting. Monroe's south of this. Um, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, there you go. Marion. Mm-hmm. Cool. Is Min- so like the difference between Marion and Monroe, Marion County is a lot more ag ground. Yep. So the value of the land is higher and you got a lot more like guys that are here for farming and for ag farming. There's not, you know, there's not as much of it that I would say is like bought up for deer hunting. So gotcha. you can drive through Marion County and you might be pretty hard pressed to find a, to see a box blind from a road. Mm. Uh, you're looking at probably 800 to a thousand dollars more an acre in Marion County on average, wow. um, down to Monroe County and you can't drive a mile without seeing a box blind. Wow. Interesting. Did, uh, is, is Elbia? That's Monroe, right? That's Monroe. Yes. Gotcha. That's where Bill's was at too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting to see how that, and, and again, I think it's done right. I mean, in order to protect that resource and continue to make Iowa a prime time buck spot, you have to push those non-resident tags down in terms of numbers and then out in terms of years to get them. Um, that's where I worry about Kansas is like, what are they going to do? Cause this is the first time they've seen an overwhelming amount of applicants for sure. Um, thousands more than they have in the past. Yeah. So I, I wonder how much that was like COVID related though, where people had, I'm sure more- part of it yeah i would say so. not a huge part but part or are, yeah. you, are we blaming are we blaming all of it on crispy is that yeah the yeah pretty it? much it's crispy's <laughs> fault we'll just continue to blame it on crispy man dude it, oh that was a giant that he got that John looked, looked a lot like this buck here that we found yeah, it was a monster i'm walking oh, your, has chris ever seen this i don't think so chris check out this um set we found on this is public land in kansas oh it's on public I, f- I found this like 50 it laid out there for a while too. Dude, I found yes. this, found this like 50 yards from the, uh, from the truck. Yeah. From the parking from area. The parking lot. The, I, I, it used to be in Iowa. You could go like walk around on mm. public ground or like. That's 180 you could, yeah, at least. You all get day. permission to go on private ground and, and go shed hunting. And I would find like sheds that were two, three, four years old. That were yeah, like that. that. Now it's like no shed left behind. Like the shed hunting <laughs> yeah. the, new, the new thing. Here's another one, dude. Here. That's a buck. Jeremy put a put an arrow in the shoulder. Oh, thanks for reminding me. A couple of years ago. Yeah, I but that's that. his his shed. How how big was this? Eighty six. Uh, yeah, eighty six. Toad. What was he like? Ten years old. He was like nine or ten. Nine or ten that year. Yeah. <sighs> and again, no pressure. Slammer. You know, deer just get old out there. And well, and dude, that's how it is. Even public land where we hunt in North Dakota, there's sheds everywhere. 
I'll tell you what. We picked up like four. Uh, how, how long is it going to be till that changes? You well, know, those places are like getting more few and far between than they used to. That's what I was going to say. I mean, North Dakota is one of those ones where, I mean, yes, we go there for mule deer. Well, who knows? That's the only place we've been. For all we know, there are several other states. I would, that have I that. would draw, I would draw there just to go hunt whitetails based on what we saw. We saw some giant. Dude, South whitetails. Dakota has some great whitetail opportunities as well. Over the counter, yeah, less pressure. Big farms. They're just overlooked states. And that's what I'm saying. Like, eventually, there is. You know, people promote these states, and and then there's a rush of people wanting to get out there. And then it's like a, and then it kind of dies off. And then there's another one. And I think it's. Yeah, I mean, Iowa is out. where it is. I don't see it changing. Kansas is going to be, that's the new thing. Like, everybody wants to go hunt Kansas. Oklahoma's another sleeper. People don't look at Oklahoma, and that's over the counter. That northeast part of Oklahoma has some giants. The other thing, too, is like, there's a, you got to, it's further. So, yeah. and that's, I like stuff like that. Cause it's like, well, somebody else might not be willing to drive 24 hours to hunt a deer. I'm like, mm. I will like that. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a bead on an Oklahoma property too. Do you? Mm-hmm. Big one. In Northeast Oklahoma. This one that we were from the other day. 3,000 acres. Via. That's a lot of agro grow. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Across the street from their current one. Okay. So. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it, Chris. <laughs> but it's, it's yeah, Are you going to come out and hunt Ohio with us this year? I don't know where I'll. I'll it's going to. We're going to have to play it. Be a little bit flexible with me on it because okay. if I have like some giant here that I'm hunting, it might be hard for me to leave. Jared does yoga, so he's pretty flexible. Yeah, I stretch. <laughs> I need to do that, dude. I yeah, me too, dude. I stretch. I'm I was just telling Colton. I woke up with like I had a kink between my shoulder blades that like a weird. It's one. probably because you were setting up that. T- bow target thing uh, do you want to know honestly i think it's from shooting it's oh yeah it's that. getting back in the that's because you pay uh pull 100 pound limbs 80 <laughs> dang i'm like at 62 or 63 i think <laughs> jared's pulling like I, 105 i've got a sweet spot um just for the species that we hunt which primarily is deer world of beast yeah i'm, sh- I'm shooting <laughs> i got a 80, 80 pound limbs on that hoy rx5 that we just got a, a week ago and i'm shooting um Oh, my arrows are like, I always forget. Like They're, 560, aren't they? No. It's like 490. Are they? I don't know. I, I think they're in the they're, fives. They're fairly heavy. And uh, I'm still getting 302. I've watched him shoot a... Which is a, sweet. I got good speed. I got good momentum. I watched him shoot a doe, literally take her off her feet. <laughs> like, hit her so it was, hard, it, it, like, took her it off It was her a feet. fawn, so... <laughs> 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 she didn't wave at 80 pounds. Knock the spots <laughs> right off of her. <laughs> I get so nervous, like, going up too much in draw weight that I'm going to have to hold my draw for an extended period of time. Yeah. And then I'm like, yeah, it's like, I don't know. I, I like that extra mm. energy and the speed, but then I get nervous that... Just naturally, I won't be able to hold my. Sure. Uh, well, uh, I will say I'm usually one to keep her on the lower end of let off just because I want the maximum performance my bow can get. So I have it cranked to the full weight. I have the least amount of let off. But I'll be honest, this one here, that 80 pound, the 80% let off wasn't enough for me. I was like, it kept wanting to go a little bit. So I hiked it up to 85 and I was like, yeah, that's it, a sweet spot. That's better. I'll shoot 70 pound limbs on mine. And we'll see from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when you start to look at kind of those areas, there are plenty of them, and there will continue to be something new. Like, I, I personally think, and I don't know if it'll be this year just because we can't hunt every day of the year, unfortunately, um, that Mississippi Delta is a very untapped resource, especially in late December, early January. There are some absolute slobs in that Delta region that – if you could find the right property, you could kill a, a mega mature every year. Well, dude, while we're on the subject, these uh, Chris, have you ever heard of these guys? Are from the Element? I think their Instagrams like the Element Wild. They're Texas guys. They're right? Texas guys, and uh, no. I think I think they're kind of small time, but they make some cool stuff. And um, they're from Texas, like mm-hmm. you said. And from what they've told me, it's like it's not any good. He's are like, they in what, Eastern Texas, probably Northern? Mm. northern texas he said southern texas gets pretty good but he's like the prices are just ridiculous i'd be on oklahoma if i were them they do yeah. quite a bit and kansas mm. it's like nine hours to kansas from them like six to oklahoma Is that like a swear word on the podcast with them kansas? no i just i don't know we swear anyway so <laughs> I, I i don't think saying any more about i mean i 
I think once the cat's out of the bag, the cat's out of the bag. Oh yeah, no yeah, doubt, man. And this kills. I mean, there's giants in Kansas. You see it every year. For sure. Even though we want to blame Crispy, I don't think he's the the issue here. No. Damn it. No, I don't. Think <laughs> I know so. Chris. He actually bow hunted up here on a lease that I had like three years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, if I killed that buck, everybody would see it as well. <laughs> oh, dude, that was a spectacular buck. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Did you see the video of Warren Holder scoring it for him? No, I missed that. I bet that was good. Um, but yeah, I mean, thought it was was gonna score or not? It's one eighties, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, I think like, it was like eighty six. Yep, Ugh. that sounds right. One eighty six. What a toad! Yeah, that's a monster. I will say that that is the one thing that'll be interesting to see because I I do think I don't I don't think Iowa could. I think Kansas could expand their non residents in some of those units if they wanted to, um, because that those numbers that we looked at is total. So that's gun and bow. Mm -hmm. So I think you could expand that in some cases on that, especially because Kansas has that early muzzle litter season in September. Um, you know, and I'm I'm sure there's a fair amount of guys that are going just to hunt for that because that rifle season's December first to the tenth or something. That's pretty short. Yeah. I don't know how many guys hunt that from a non resident perspective. That seems like the only thing residents hunt is like that gun season. <laughs> yeah. I don't see any residents out hunting. I don't think anybody that. in Kansas owns a bow. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are a handful of them, but yeah, most of those landowners and residents just are straight rifle gun hunting. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it, it will it'll just naturally kind of evolve. And again, if you want to kill big bucks in Kansas, maybe it does have to go to a one preference point and then you get drawn type of thing. It's still funny though. It's such a weird conversation because it's like literally all that matters to you is that there is one buck that is big. I care about. that is where you're hunting. I don't care about it's just it's so hard to know that or or hone in on that just having these general conversations about like iowa has big bucks which is true but mm -hmm. i mean that's all it is the next what two months right the only thing i care about between now and mid september is find one buck on one of the farms i'm hunting and be like yep that's the deer i want to kill so chris when we draw in two or three years you, you got some leads that we can try to work yeah. Mm -hmm. Try to figure something out. We don't. We don't have a plan as of now. Yeah, no. The plan as of now is put in for points, and then when the time comes, we'll figure something out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the best route to take, and I can definitely help point you guys in the right direction to get on. He'll give us a D farm. <laughs> That'd be appreciated. It's like maybe not A and B, but you can go see your D farm. It's all right. Yeah, we'll take it. Yeah, it is. Um, it is one of those things that it, you hear growing up. I mean, and again, looking at Drury's and. Lakoskis and Kiskis and everybody. Even the Wenzels, man. Well, yeah. Back and you're like, day. man, Iowa is the place to be. And it's not that I don't think that there are big bucks in Iowa, but, but we hunt Kansas. We're hunting Illinois. We hunt Ohio. Like, uh, there's something about Iowa that just is a lure to that. But, like, is there a potential to be disappointed? I'll, I'll throw another one out there, too, that <clears throat> right now is inaccessible, but that... um it's just Canada. Oh, Canada. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh Canada. Canada. There are some giants in Canada that right. um, we just got to beat Trudeau's ass and get across the border. Well, it's the same deal as some of these hard to reach Hunter, states. Like as yeah. long as you're willing to drive and or get, oh, I'll hunt Alberta there. and Saskatchewan. Yes. So there it was, hot on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can't go back to our Canadian bacon reference. Ian will <laughs> yeah. lose his mind. So yeah, I think if, I think that if someone was disappointed with southern iowa when they came here to hunt it's probably because they had false expectations before they got here mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's probably it i think a lot of people look at it and they're like all right i'm gonna come out and kill booner yeah and i'm gonna see a bunch of them as well i've lived here for well my whole life started hunting in 2001 i killed my first deer and i've only i've killed two deer over 180 in 20 years or whatever the heck that is way yeah. to trash our hopes chris Wow. <laughs> I've seen some. I've seen some giants. Yeah. I just kill them. Yeah. Well, I, look back it, at like the, I look back at like that late 90s, like mid 2000 range. And like maybe it was just because I was younger and like a kid and I thought they were bigger than what they actually were. But like I look back in my head and I'm like all the times I messed up. And mm -hmm. just I'll tell you, Chris, I, I do think that's the case. I, yeah. I experienced the same thing. Yeah. You just go back and 
I have to bigger. ask my dad sometimes, or yeah, guys that were mm -hmm. of age at that time. I'm like, was this really? Was it that? And he's like, no, nah, that's about what it is now. Well, I mean, that's what that's what kind of gets me. Like, obviously, I was hunting a big one here in Pennsylvania, but I remember I was probably in high school. Um, it was like the last day of bow season in Pennsylvania, and I remember watching like four or five doe come like busting out of this thicket, and like behind it in my head was like the biggest non typical buck I've ever seen. Like just trash and shit everywhere, like points everywhere. And like in my head rewinding, I'm like, was that like a 190 plus? Like, was that like the biggest Pennsylvania buck like I had ever seen? Probably was like a 150 at the time, yeah. you know, but it's <clears throat> up until that point, like, and still there are guys today that they're family members of mine, unfortunately, that'll be like, man, like I saw a 150 last night in this field. It was huge. And I'm like, you've never seen no, a 150 no, you in didn't. your life. Yeah. No, it, no, no, you didn't. it's the, yeah, yeah, but it's I, the but Billy Madison, no, Chris Farley thing yes. is like, yeah, you know, a guy I know, he and her got it on. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> they, no, they didn't. <laughs> but that's it. Cause I'm like, her got it on. I'm listening to him tell me about it. And he's like, yeah, I mean, he's like, it was just a big eight, but like easy one yeah. fifties. I'm like, have you ever seen 150 inch eight point? That's freaking wow. huge. And, and you learn to know, I mean, just know who those guys might. I love him, but my dad is one of them. <laughs> it's like, I just don't believe anything he tells me about deer anymore. He's like, if he saw, if he told me he saw 10 deer, I'm like, okay, you probably saw three. Yeah. He's like, if you saw 150, okay, you probably saw 120. Yeah. It's like, just, you got to know what the, the scale well, is. And I mean, I've had it happen. You're in a tree stand and like, like, let's say buck comes cruising through, like chasing a doe and you're like, with you, if you tell me it's a 150, I'm like, it's probably 135. <laughs> Well, I mean, that Kansas buck was a good example. I, I thought it was 150 when we killed it, and it was almost 160. What would you say on your mule deer? You look back at me, you're like, 130. 140? No, you said 140. 140. 140. <laughs> what was he, 150? 115. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't know. We're white, though, yeah, guys. We're, we're white. white. Though. He had a dry time. We killed him. Yeah. That's awesome. But it is. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, again, I think it all comes back to those expectations. And it is one of those reasons that it's kind of weird when you're like, like I'm excited to go and hunt Iowa, but also like I might have a bigger buck in Pennsylvania to kill than I ever see in Iowa when I'm out there, mm -hmm. but it's one and that's the only one. Well, just the fact that we have to wait so long and like that we get to talk about it for years and years, mm -hmm. like wh whether we kill or even see a buck in Iowa, it's like, it's just, it'll just be an experience. Chris, have you been bow hunting out of, out of the muddy box blinds? Yeah. The last, the last three years, four years. So Jared killed this buck, um, out of one, the first year we had him. I, I like the boys and I have hunted out of them a lot. Um, do you like it more than a tree stand? I like sitting in a tree stand just for the feel of sitting yeah. in a tree stand, but I don't think there's any better way to hone in and kill us a higher age deer than on, in a box blind. Interesting. Just the fact that, you don't have to worry about wind switching as much. You don't have to mm -hmm. worry about, you can get away when the thermals start dropping, you know, in the, in the evening when that wind dies down and, um, like you, you know, like going back to Mark Drury, that guy's been hunting out of box blinds longer than most people back before it was fairly common. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you look back at his old videos and they used to hunt out of tree stands. Now you won't ever see him hunting out of a tree stand. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's box blinds. And they're even putting box blinds now in and draws and pinches and middle of CRP fields. And, and, and the best thing about a box blind is like, sometimes the X where you need to be I may agree. not have the perfect tree. Yep. So the fact that you can put the perfect tree right where it needs to be and you can plan your exit and entrance and all that stuff. I mean, it's just a very deadly way to, to kill big deer and it's comfortable. But then again, I mean, there's nothing, there's <clears throat> nothing better than sitting in a stand on a, you know, cold yeah. morning, early November, late October and watching the sunrise too. That's, that's great too. But, um, it's just, your odds aren't quite as high. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's very many people that would argue with the effectiveness of a box blind. Um, it's just a price point thing probably. It is. It is. I mean, but even like Jared and I were kind of leaning Cause I, into cause it. I would, if yeah. I could buy in, if I could put out 10 or 15 box blinds w without it bankrupting me, I would do it. Yeah. I but, mean, and anymore, I mean, again, with Tim or with lumber prices, you're not building one for much cheaper than, yeah, than you're buying no, them for. Not, not right now. And yeah. like that farm we bought, you know, we've, we're going to, we're, we're looking at it somewhat as an, I mean, I'm looking at a box blind as somewhat as an investment too. It uh, is. It, 
it's you know like these new hawk ones that are coming out they've got a lifetime warranty on them yeah that's crazy so they're there's nothing on that blind that and that's what i'm going to put on this new farm we're going to put three of them up mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing on that blind that can rot out or have any issues with it and if someday we decide to, to sell that piece by investing in those blinds and putting those plots where we put them and doing all that work i mean it you're going to see a return there yeah. at some yeah. point I mean, that's a good point you know, yeah. investment, but when you there's something about having something teed off where someone can walk in and be like okay this is like this is perfect everything 100 oh, percent. well i mean take a note out of mark and terry's book or even the whitetail properties guys when they get into a property or they buy a property and they put in plots and a gate and they put up some box blinds and stuff the person they're showing to sell that property to is like damn like this is the spot just yeah. has to aesthetically it's be the right buyer for it too but i mean there's obviously yeah. plenty of has them. to aesthetically look like the spot mm -hmm. you know and yes. there's, there's something to be said with that for sure i do think that it uh, you know from a kid's standpoint it's been a huge change to how we hunt and when we hunt and how much we hunt for sure um, I, I think that I've probably missed, I think we all three of us have probably missed a ton of opportunities on bucks because there wasn't the right tree. You know, yeah. you're like, ah, if I could be in that one, I'd probably kill him, but I'm gonna have to be over here. And then, yeah, Dude, you know, I, I, I can remember quite a bit hunting out of tree stands thinking like, man, how, how can't we design something that's like a, just a mobile tree like how do i just make a tree over there like yeah what kind of a tower device or what kind of a thing could i use to get a tree stand over there yeah and the box blind seems to be kind of the manifestation of that it's not quite what i envisioned but yeah maybe it's better jeremy did you see the uh so like a lot would have been last fall ireland i picked her up from school and she wanted to go she wanted to go deer hunting with me mm -hmm. so she's six she i mean her bow is like a little like play bow yeah and i'm like you know what let's go she's like i want to shoot one with my bow did you see that video i posted i did chance? man <laughs> you did or didn't i did when you were in the in the blind dude so yeah so show, my daughter the show these line. guys do you have it on your phone i got it on my phone yeah, yeah bring it up so this deer comes walking by us at like <laughs> literally 10 yards oh that's too funny and I mean, this is the type of deer where it's like, once again, not the highest scoring deer, but I mean, just from an age point yeah, perspective, I would have killed just him. An old brood of a deer. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> She's like, "There's a huge buck." I like how you cut those little uh, peepholes through those. It, it comes with that. Does yeah, it, it comes with them. Yep. I haven't put mine up yet. Really? Mm -mm. Look at this thing, though. Mm. That's tough. I mean, he walks right in front of us. But anyway, so yeah, that was a. Uh, Does she it shoot was, it with Alex, her bow? Alex, so what's that? Does she shoot it with her bow? No, I said you can't shoot at that one. But then there's two. <laughs> oh, two I thought the video was gonna be her, like no, I mean she heart had, she, punching she this thing and it bouncing off. She couldn't. She would never be able to kill that thing anyway. But like, I didn't want to spook him, so I'm like, let him go off. And then these two does walk in, and he's gone now. So I'm like, yeah, you can shoot one of those does if you want. So she draws her little kid's bow back and starts flinging arrows and misses by a mile. And then she's like, I didn't get one. And then she starts, she's broke down, started bawling. Jeez. Um, and, and I'm like, Oh my God, I feel horrible right now, but it was so cool to have her experience that. And now she just like wants to keep going. And my dad used to Alex tell was funny because Alex had been bow hunting, like every opportunity she had. Yeah. And this was like where I pick Ireland up. Alex had, was still working. So I'm like, yeah, let's just go sit in the blind. I drive like a hundred yards from the blind, not even caring about, yeah. you know, that's how sure it goes, I, man. That is how it goes. Yeah, and just walk up there and there's an hour left to light, kick deer off the food pot when we get there. And then uh, this six or seven year old, old buck just walks right in front of us. And I, that is I said to go to Alex, I'm like, you should have been here tonight. And she calls me. She's like, are you kidding me? I cannot believe that just happened. Wow. I remember, uh, You're like, don't worry. I use my landowner tag on it. Yeah. I remember yeah. back in the, uh, it's probably the eighties and nineties when my dad was bow hunting. You, I guess you couldn't shoot does during bow season. Like you had to shoot a buck. And so he mm -hmm. made stump arrows. I don't know if this is legal. Matt's not here. So it doesn't matter. But he would put like these big rubber stumps on them, and he would shoot does as they walk by with these like stump arrows. Like a um, it's like, yeah, a like a big rubber, like, like a techno hunt. Yeah, he just like would shoot does with them as like he was just waiting for bucks to come by. That's pretty funny. 
You know, I feel like my bow would still put them, put it through them. <laughs> <laughs> Probably have a tennis it ball. It would have broke their shoulder. <laughs> Kill it with a tennis ball. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just like kookunk. <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, you do. I remember clearly the first deer I killed with my bow was like a, a buck fawn or something, and like, but the day before, like my dad's in one spot, I'm in the other. We're in like a soybean field. You know, it's still standing. And like these does come out at like 20 yards and like my dad like clearly will tell the story of like he would hear like dunk like my arrow going through the soybean dunk Mm. (laughs) like it was like i emptied the quiver and didn't like touch him (laughs) and it was like he like came over he's like did you get one i was like no (laughs) like Mm. not even close you know and it's just that's how you learn but like those experiences are like dude the the evolution into being an effective bow hunter is not a pretty one well, that's, I got in, again, YouTube, I got into a, a chiming match back and forth because somebody was like, hey, you guys are wrong by calling crossbows closer to rifles than vertical bows. And I was like, I'm not wrong. Like, they are. They're more. I can't really even read the comments. Like, I'm not even going to look at comments in this thing. <laughs> I, saw, I don't read comments. Yeah. Oh, that's why I have to because Jared doesn't want to read them. I don't think you have to either. Uh, don't, don't, don't send me any screenshots when someone's giving me shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not going to help you any. Yeah, the only reason Chris kills big deer is because he hunts public li- or private land. <laughs> you know, but it, it is like you think about it. Like, I could literally go out, put a, a three to nine power scope on my crossbow take it out, shoot a couple times, and then go out and kill a deer out to 50 yards. I mean, in fairness, it's its own weapon. but I, it's, I'm not saying it's not. Yeah, it's got a lot of advantages over a vertical bow, just like a just like a compound does over a recurve. Like, uh-huh. That's also fair. For sure. But I don't think any of us would say that it's the same to kill a buck with a compound bow as it is a recurve bow. 100% not. Do you know Iowa doesn't allow uh, uh, crossbows? No. Good. Wow. Well, there's one reason I mean, why <laughs> here's, the, here's like the one, um, the one thing that I think is kind of silly about it though. Actually, that's like, not good. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. So like, the, no, but the one thing it's silly, like I'm, I'm okay if that's the rule, but like, for instance, like Ireland, my daughter, it's going to be seven. The only way that she can participate in bow hunting and during the, the season is she has to shoot a, yeah, like, that's bullshit. Yep. Vertical. Yeah, that's that's, what, that's actually what made me retract my statement was yeah, and that that's where I'm like, man, like the state is so against crossbows that they won't even let a kid. Yeah, that's go out not right. Is that against the rut period? Or go, is that period? Not, or? not at all. You cannot use a crossbow. The only way you can use a crossbow is if you, I think Doctor. it's over sixty five years old or you have a disability. Yep, medical. Even in rifle season, she can. Nope. The only time you can use it is late muzzleloader season. Hmm. So, so youth season in Iowa, so like I, I can, let's say she gets a youth tag. Yeah. Yep. She can use a custom muzzleloader, but she can't use a. That's stupid, uh, man. Well, and, and the only reason my five-year-old hunted last year is because he could use a crossbow. So he's not getting his ass kicked by a rifle or a, a shotgun mm-hmm. or a muzzleloader. Yep. So it, so like we're, all, we're supposed to be all about, you know, yep. getting the kids involved. Yeah, and that's like, dumb. You know, like a small kid. Now, 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 like, let's say her now she might be 13, 14 years old before she has the ability to pull back enough draw weight to yeah. make me feel comfortable to let her out there to shoot at a live animal. Yeah. And that's crazy, man. That's but, just taking yeah, time I, I, away. That, that time it's hard to get, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with kids nowadays where they have 100%. Of things they can go do. And now we're not going to let them, let them go out there and experience archery until they're yeah, that's insane. Well, that is... back. And by that time they might be lost doing other things. For sure. It is an interesting um, like variable to it. Cause like I had to wait, I never shot a crossbow. I, yeah, I couldn't hold your bow old. till I was 12. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't, I didn't shoot my bow till I was 14. I mean, I had a bow, but I didn't I, hunt. I tell, tell I you what though, man, I don't know that I would have been like c- competent to kill an, an animal or understand what I'm doing until I was that age in fairness. Well, but we never I had think lot, mentors. Every kid's different. I think a lot of it has to do with who is teaching that kid what to do and not saying you didn't have a good teacher at all, but like, look at like, you know, look at Jay Gregory's kids. They were like killing deer with bows when they were like nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and every kid is different, right? Like there's some kids that just like with athletics or yep. with reading mm-hmm. or with whatever else, I mean, we're all at different stages at different times and for sure. Yeah. I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I, I just find it kind of interesting how <laughs> a kid can't use a cross. Yeah, that doesn't, that's bullshit uh, to my, yeah. yeah, I don't think that's right. I mean, because in fairness, like 
Carter killed his first buck this year with a gun. That's the first deer he's killed. He hunted last year as an eight-year-old, probably wasn't ready to hunt as a seven-year-old. But Harlan literally turned five December 17th, and on the 26th killed his first deer with a crossbow. Yeah. And it's just differences in terms of, and he had been practicing because his brother had been practicing, right? I'm so. honestly, I'm feeling, I feel torn about it. Cause like, man, as much as I want kids and anybody to have access, mm -hmm. I, I, this whole podcast, I've been saying I'm in favor of um, making deer harder to kill. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, I think there should be some kind of a barrier to entry and whether it's like, hey, you just have to be able to shoot a crossbow, maybe that is it, mm -hmm. or, or you have to be able to pull a bow and, and shoot it with this thing. Like, that's... Mm -hmm. And that's hard. I mean, that you are talking... And I don't know how you match that up, Chris, like you said, to, like, each individual kid's level of competency. That's difficult to do. Yeah. I mean, because most, most kids can't... I mean, Carter's nowhere close. He, sh he has a vertical bow. He's nowhere close to being able to kill a deer with it. Yeah. Not just yeah. in proficiency, but in weight. Well, and mine was, like, when I was old enough to go hunting i was also old enough for my dad to say okay your stand's over there go climb in it and yeah that's a whole call different me if you game. kill something yeah yeah i mean i like started to hunt and then it took me 10 years of messing up to finally be like okay i i think i can I and know that's what I'm doing it's here. a fair <laughs> argument i mean because when we grew up hunter safety course 12 years old now you can hunt when mentor yeah. came in i think it's a great thing but it opens it up i mean you know, Harlan doesn't even, he buys a mentor license, but he doesn't have tags. Like we tag things with my tags as the mentor. Carter at nine years old is still a mentor, but he has a whole set of tags that he can use separate from my tags, mm -hmm. you know? And so can he go and kill one with a vertical bow? No, he's proficient with a crossbow. He's proficient with a, a gun, a shotgun. At this case, I won't let him shoot a rifle yet. Cause there's, you know, he just doesn't need to, he's not shooting far enough for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something to, I, I think, as crossbows, I'm not anti-crossbow. Number one, I'm 100% I'm for them for kids. I think it's the best way to get a kid into hunting and to become proficient at some point with a gun without the fear of kicks, loud noises, et cetera. Um, I'm for it for disabled. I'm for it for seniors. Mm -hmm. But I think that when it comes to that middle group, I'm not against it, but looping that into archery season i'm not necessarily for either yeah that's just me yeah there, i mean this debate could go so many different directions it's like I'm, I'm sure that back when people who were shooting traditional bows that was the main thing and then compound bows came back i'm sure said they the had same thing 100 yeah. yeah they said the like, same thing and I sit there and I look at it and I'm just looking at it. For, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't, I'd like to, I don't know if there's studies that show like once crossbows were introduced, what that did to the quality of the herd. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, I don't know the right answer. Did it, you know, I don't, there's so many variables involved. I do know that the best time to kill a big deer is sitting in a, a blind with a muzzle loader or yeah. a firearm. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we, we can do that, but then, yeah. you know, it's like, and also, <sighs> Like my buddy from Michigan, uh, I, I got target panic really, really bad, and I had to fight through it. Me too. And um, and he and he and I got through it. I got through. It. I mean, it it was a pain in the ass. It was almost to the point where I missed three or four deer, three or four bucks in two years, and I was like, dude, I'm done. Like I can't, I can't do it. Yep. And and he's got it so bad. I mean, I'm not saying like let's just make an excuse and take a crossbow out, right? But like he got it so bad where. He had a deer come in. It was like 165 inch 10. He rattled. This deer comes in, knew the deer for three years. It comes into 12 yards and he had it so bad where he would bring the pen down to the top of the back and his pen would hit the back and it would like, it would just shoot up. Right. So like he'd have to get to here and they'd have to like pull really hard and, and let it go. And he's like, dude, I did everything in my power. Like I, I literally like did the stand set up. Perfect. I, rattled at the right you know i rattled this deer came in i fooled this six or seven year old deer and i did everything and hmm. you know then i had target painting so bad i missed can't so make the shot he's like well now he goes to kansas and he strictly uses a crossbow mm -hmm. and um he his his philosophy is he he's not getting that much more range out of him sure. but he's more efficient and yep. he doesn't you know i'm not it's saying easier. like 
It's 100%. I mean, it's the easy. argument for both sides, right? I see, there I is, see man. for both yeah. sides. And when we're looking at hunter recruitment, you know, like we live in a world where there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, how I get the nostalgia, though, of taking the time to practice mm-hmm. and practice and practice and and get really proficient. And then I also get the point where some guys are like, well, I don't have time to practice that much because I got kids going on. I'm working yep. overtime. I got family stuff. I want to take my crossbow out, shoot it. 10 times, make sure it's good to go. And I'm still, my effective yards is still going to be 40 yards within. I'm not going to take a shot right. farther than that. Yeah. You know, Makes every sense. weapon we have, there is a point where, and a lot of it depends on who's behind the trigger, right? Like, but yeah. there is a point where that effective range starts dropping off. And yeah. that's up to <laughs> hunters to understand where that, where that line is and only take shots that we should take. But I, I see both sides of it. Um, I don't know the right answer. I'm a compound bow guy. I fought through it. I got to a point where I could shoot a compound. I shoot a lot, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. but I, I don't know. It's, well, dude, that it's conversation that applies. The conversation applies, I think, to more than just the, the weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, maybe that's where it's uh, the most applicable, but I mean, um, cell cameras are probably one of the most debatable um, to, to where, and it's a fact I can look at and say like that kills deer hundred percent. Yes. Um, and really debatable out West on like, on ponds or, you know, like yep. water holes yep. and stuff too. I mean, there's some states. Is Montana still outlawing trail cameras in general during the season? Maybe. I'm I think that. But in the, in the same way where, like, I'm yeah. saying, you know, a rifle is an advantage uh, over a bow mm-hmm. and whether you agree or, or disagree with how they should be included in seasons, the same conversation could easily be had about trail cameras or box blinds. 100%. Sense. Any tool – and all of them ultimately come down to, yeah, who's behind the trigger? Who's setting up the camera? Who's hanging the, mm-hmm. who's, yeah, all this stuff. But um, I don't know. It I, is I don't interesting. Answer for it. I mean, I know, Jared, you went through target panic. Yeah, real bad. The, the buck I told oh, you. It's the, it's the worst. I hope anybody watching well, this, I'll tell right, you, you haven't dealt with it. I, I'll, it give, I'll give you the answer for what cured mine. And I got it from the guy at uh, Carter Releases. It was super helpful. It was just at an ATA show. I grabbed him for an hour, and he helped me through it. What I did, did, you to, did you go to a thumb release? Yep. Yeah. And, and that alone didn't fix it. It was a combination of things. And, and actually what caused it. Yeah. You can come in and join the podcast if you want. Yeah, dude. It's a party. More the merrier. Is that Blake? Podcast. Yeah, it's Blake. What's up, Blake? <clears throat> what up, dude? What's up, guys? Howdy. Chris was just giving us all your uh, spots for big bucks, so don't worry about it. We got, we some, got, p- we got some pens. <laughs> Uh-huh. you're all gonna die of ehd this year again uh, yeah yeah awesome. i'll let you guys get back to it all right brother see you brother you gonna buy me lunch today or what i'm not i'm gonna die if you ain't buying lunch <laughs> i see that blake's looking <laughs> lean and mean see you, man. what what caused it for me initially chris was i switched um i switched bows to a higher poundage bow it's actually that carbon spider at um 80 pounds? Yeah, it was 80. Yeah, I put those 80-pound limbs on it. Um, and at the same time, I switched to a, a Spot Hog Wise Guy, which is a trigger release, a wrist trigger release uh, with a real tight um, tension. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever you call it. It's a real crisp. Like, there's no play in that trigger. It's it's on or it's off. Mm-hmm. And I think those two things combined just really got my, my brain – having too much anxiety around the shot and so i'm a bottom up guy and so i'd bring it up and my bow started getting heavier and heavier and then i'd have to at the last minute bring it up and 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 pull that trigger yeah and so this was probably over the course of like two years it just was getting Mm -hmm. worse and worse and i was missing deer shooting way under them and and sometimes compensating and shooting over them and it was just ugly it was bad it is and it's a mental game too it's all mental that's the that's the hard thing. It's yeah. like there's nothing wrong with your bow. It's yeah. it's all mental. So how I was able to train that out to where it's it's almost completely gone at this point. I, I would say 95% of it is cured. I And you know, the 5% that's remaining is just the fact that I'm aware of it. I'm mm-hmm. like, man, I, I know what it's like to feel that. So what I did was I got rid of the bow completely. I took it out of the equation. This was after the season. And I switched to um, this Carter Wise Choice, um, which is the the – it's a thumb release that he recommended, and, man, I just – I love it. Yep. Um, and I shot exclusively for months and months a trainer. Just a – it looks like a little tube with a string that comes out of it. Okay. And I was just shooting that for 
three months probably. Mm -hmm. And all I was doing there was familiarizing myself with the, um, the way that this release felt and removing any positive or negative feedback I would get from hitting a target, mm -hmm. you know, where I want to hit it. So that's gone. All I'm doing is feeling the shot. And then eventually I reintroduced the bow, um, but not the target. So I would, I was blind bailing. I would close my eyes. Okay. Yep. yep. Draw the target back. I'd have it like two feet in front of me so I couldn't miss. And I wasn't looking. I didn't want to have any connotation with missing it negative or positive. I was just shooting the bow, shooting the bow and feeling the release, shooting the bow and feeling the release. I did that for maybe a month. <clears throat> and then eventually I would open my eyes and shoot the thing at like five yards, five yards, five yards for weeks and weeks. And then I would go to 10 yards, 20 yards. And so now I've got this feel for the bow that I never had before with a release that I have less control over, which is a positive thing. And I could start to extend my range and it's just that's where game. I'm at now. Yeah. And it's, it's almost totally gone. You definitely got to battle through it. It's, it's, it can be, it can be very uh, frustrating. Well, and it's hard too, because, you know, even from a practice standpoint, I mean, number one is confidence going into it, but like the emotions that are tied to, you know, any deer, but a big buck coming in, then on top of that, having target panic, you know, really start to stack up pretty quickly. Yeah. Oh, big time. So. Well, dude, we, uh, we appreciate you coming on Hunter podcast. I know you got a bunch of stuff to get cranked on today and, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have you back on here at some point. And I guess we got to figure out where you're going to come hunt with us at. Yeah, man. See, you thought you were going to be a boring podcast and we went for two and a half hours and we didn't cover a third half of the stuff <laughs> I wanted to get to. So we'll have to do it again soon. Yeah. Bye man. Yep. Yeah. You guys keep in touch and appreciate what you guys do for GSM and that brother. We appreciate you guys, man. We're excited. I know Jared and I are going to get a couple hawk box blinds too this year, and you know we've got for these cameras coming too. Uh, that's what we're really excited about. Yeah, and these where are these boss buck uh, legs at? Yeah, we need some feeder I, I would, legs. Yeah, I know we need those. We need I was, feeder I was legs. Lucky that I, um, I get to be like part of the beta testing program for all the cell cams every year. I so those, I still get them in like November or October of the year before. So like, yeah, I would say that the new cell cams are badass, and I know that like. How do we get he in on his beta phone. program? I've got I've got Chris's <laughs> login, so I can attest there that they're go. pretty badass. Need to get out and check it out, but no, they're <laughs> they are cool, man. I think between the 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 color night feature, like literally a one push button for color night feature, the image quality, not that it was bad, but like is just miles above what the initial one was. Yeah. I will say, sure. just overall from a stealth cam and, and a manifest standpoint, and I know we're we're taking big steps ahead this year. The reliability of those cameras last year made my season like far too often i'm investing in cellular cameras and they just they fail frankly they're just they're trash yeah the solar panels yeah. are a game changer yeah. the, the point of cell cameras is to not have to go and check them yes and cell cams for so long failed at that i think you guys are winning especially at when we're going out to kansas dropping them and expecting them to be there and, and still performing data for us when we come and hunt in november and they fall apart in september and then it's like now what now yeah. we've got cameras running. <laughs> Moultrie. In, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now we've got the unfortunate thing now is we've got reliable stealth cams and solar panels in Kansas running. Where we and can't we're not hunting yeah. them this year. Or a year too late. So we'll just be watching bucks this year instead of hunting them. But yeah, that's gonna drive you nuts when oh. you're sitting with like giants and already it, is. Yeah. So. You're, you're, gonna, you're basically gonna torture yourself. Yeah, we may shut those <laughs> bad boys like, down. You turn that app off and like, <laughs> get the photos, but don't look at it until after. Just the research. Season. It's research for now. Yeah. Yeah. we're just we're getting it but no man we appreciate it and we appreciate the gsm support we've got a lot of cool things coming with those brands and um excited to have a good season and but yeah we'll loop you back in here for sure as we get closer to fall and, and get you out on one of these hunter hunts with us on in ohio or in illinois or something right on guys i'm looking forward to it and appreciate you having me on thanks buddy right, we'll talk soon later I had to cut you off because he's got a call. We, we got 10 minutes to eat and then, you know, we got to jump back on. Oh, we got a 1230? I think yeah. he had to be off at 1132, so. 11. He, yeah, he missed it. I'll do wardrobe <laughs> change. Yeah. Oh, 1130 Central. No, 11. Oh, it was 11? Yeah. It wasn't an important call. That's what I told him. It's not important. I'm on here. so He's like, us. oh, it's Mark Drury. He's trying to get me to come out. I'm like, yeah. No, no not important. 
cool call, cool call though, man. I mean, just yeah, to, to get into some of that Iowa stuff and, and understand that, yeah, I mean, there are big bucks there, but there's not giants in every, every corner nook and cranny yeah. out there. And, yeah. you know, you still have to work for them, but, um, you know, Chris is obviously a good friend of ours and, and is in touch with a lot of the products that we're using. And so it's really neat to kind of see how that all formats to, what his expectations are and how he's hunting out there and, and excited to see how his new farm develops too. Absolutely. Um, and always good to have a friend in Iowa when we achieve five points. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, we appreciate everybody listening to the Hunter podcast number 23 with Chris Duncan from GSM. We will see you in five minutes. We're going <laughs> to eat, eat rally and on to the next one. It's a fun day. Yeah. Uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Sing me. See ya.